Well, good evening, everybody. Happy Friday the 13th. And uh, I think that uh, half of us are going to be leaving this theater here tonight, more convinced than ever that the superstitions are true about the, that infamous date. My name is Chris Arnzen. I am the host of Iron Sharpens Iron Radio, which you can hear anywhere in the world at ironsharpensironradio.com. In fact, tonight, believe it or not, uh, we have uh, folks who have driven all the way from Indiana and Virginia to be here uh, tonight. And I want to everybody give them a round of applause for making the long drive. IronSharpensIronRadio.com. It's a daily live two-hour program for those of you who are not familiar with it. Uh, I have interviewed some of the most well-known uh, figures from Christendom today, including both of our debaters today, uh, Dr. Tony Acosta and Dr. Robertson Jenis have both been on my program, even though they are on opposing sides theologically. And uh, it is my pleasure and delight to have my first annual Carlisle debate. And I hope that next year, if I do this, each of you bring about 20 people with you <laughs> so we could have more people at the next debate if God uh, so chooses to permit us to have another debate here in Carlisle. Uh, I have some people that I need to thank uh, for this event. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, everybody at the Carlisle Theater for providing this venue for us at a very reasonable price. And for having everything ready for us tonight. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lorenda, the manager at the Carlisle Vault, who helped us yesterday with a wonderful pastor's luncheon that we had and uh, could not have done it without her assistance. I want to thank WPFG Radio uh, for promoting this event. Uh, and I want to thank also Cumberland Valley Bible Book Services for sponsoring my program and making this event uh, possible as well. The publishers of the New American Standard Bible are also to be thanked for this event. Lynbrook Baptist Church, all the way out in Long Island, New York, helped sponsor this event. And Wading River Baptist Church, also in New York. And I uh, obviously uh, thank, from the bottom of my heart, both uh, Dr. Tony Costa of Toronto Baptist Seminary and Dr. Robertson Jenis of Catholic Apologetics International, who are both participating tonight and both promoted this event as well. Our moderator is uh, Anthony Uvinio of New York Apologetics. And the thing that makes New York Apologetics stand out is basically they just talk about theological issues like this, you know, like superlapsarianism and whatnot, you know. But uh, Anthony Uvinio is our moderator, and I'm so delighted that he is here, and he has been a huge help to me, as has uh, Susan Hopkins, her son Joe Ignacio, and her daughter, Jade Ignacio, who have been volunteering and helping out a great deal. And uh, also, uh, Austin is uh, here volunteering as a uh, videographer. And I cannot forget uh, David Wood, who many of you, or some of you at least, may have seen David debating himself. Uh, David is an apologist in his own right with AnsweringMuslims.com. He is a former atheist who became a Christian and primarily debates Muslims uh, all over, and has debated them all over the world, some of the top Muslim clerics and scholars. Uh, he is actually here videotaping this event. Instead of actually participating as a debater, he has got quite a professional level of videography skills, and I thank uh, him for being here tonight. Uh, this is a, an issue that, to a lot of people, is very offensive. This is a, uh, a venue, I should say, where people of different theological perspectives, perspectives and religions are publicly not only defending what they believe, but also exposing error in the opponent's uh, positions as far as the, re the religion adhered to by that opponent. And people, for some reason, are horrified by that. Uh, people think that that is bigotry, that's hate. And that's absolutely ridiculous. Obviously, people involved in debates can be bigots and hateful, but nothing be, could be farther from the truth as far as the events that I've run since the uh, 1990s. In fact, that's where I first met Robertson Jenis uh, of Catholic Apologetics International when he 
was involved in one of the debates that I had, I had arranged on Long Island, New York, uh, featuring Dr. Syngenis and Dr. James R. White of Alpha Omega Ministries. He was involved in a couple of those early debates. And uh, if, if you believe something passionately to be true, it is absolutely ridiculous if you hide that and keep that to yourself and not want to not only share it with other people, but urge them to believe in it as well. If you think that your religion is something that is a personal, private matter between you and God, then either you don't really have very much confidence that it's true, or you really don't care that much about the souls of those you love and meet. Because obviously, if you did think that it was true and important, and you care about others, you're going to want them to agree with you on very important matters of faith. And so that's why I do these debates. We have people who disagree on very important issues uh, in forums, in public forums that are moderated in time and so on. And uh, I hope that you urge your friends and family to come to future events uh, because of that, because this is, as I said, this is not only to honor what we believe God's truth to be, but it's also to enlighten our friends and family and loved ones about that truth. And if you believe what the Roman Catholic Church believes and teaches about Mary, then Protestants are very seriously in error. And if you are uh, a Roman Catholic and you are in error in the way that you honor Mary, if what you are doing and saying and believing about Mary is an error, those errors are very, very serious. Uh, there can only be one uh, side here that is biblically uh, faithful on this issue, and even historically faithful as far as the Christian church is concerned. And so these men who are debating each other, they don't hate each other. They are trying their best to convince one another and you in the audience to believe in what they believe to be true. And uh, this is not an issue where it's like the difference between putting garland or tinsel on a Christmas tree or something like that. These are, these are vitally important issues. These are issues that have uh, eternity hinged on them. And uh, I hope that you take uh, the debaters seriously tonight. And by the way, I'd ask you to pray for uh, one of our debaters, uh, Dr. Robertson Jenis. He's, he's a very sick man. I'm not talking about his cold that he has. He's a very sick man. you got to pray for him. <laughs> but uh, Robertson Jenis is, uh, I, thank, I am very thankful that he showed up tonight, even though he is feeling very under the weather. And uh, you can't use that as an excuse, though, Bob, that uh, if things don't go well uh, tonight for you, we, uh, we can't let that happen as an excuse. But kind of to even out the playing field anyway, uh, Dr. Tony Costa doesn't realize this, but I slipped some salmonella in his lunch today, so... They'll both be equally sick by the midway through the, uh, the event. But uh, I am uh, now going to uh, turn this over uh, to uh, Anthony Uvinio. Oh, by the way, just to get, let you know a little bit something about myself, I happen to be a former Roman Catholic. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. I was an altar boy. I uh, went to the Catholic school for eight years. And in the 1980s, I became a Bible-believing, born-again believer in Jesus Christ. And I have many friends, family members, and loved ones who are Roman Catholic. And I do these things out of not only love for God and the truth of God primarily, but of, out of love for them. And I know that uh, uh, Dr. Robertson Jenis is here and is a former Protestant. He may have began as a Catholic. We'll find out when he gets a more formal introduction from our moderator. But he was, for quite a number of years, a Protestant who became a Catholic. Uh, and I know that our uh, debater, uh, Tony Costa, who is representing historic Protestantism on this issue, he also was a Roman Catholic that converted uh, to Protestantism. And so just to give you an idea of where we are all coming from, but my friend Anthony Uvinio of NewYorkApologetics.com is going to take it over from here, and he is going to give our debaters a more formal and in-depth introduction, but I thank you all from the bottom of my heart for being here today, and I hope you are blessed before you leave this uh, theater. God bless you. Okay, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, now we're going to begin the uh, opening commentary for each of the presenters. Tonight's debate 
is entitled Mary, Sinless Queen of Heaven, or Sinner Saved by Grace. On my left is Dr. Robert Sungenis, and he's going to be presenting Mary, Sinless Queen of Heaven. He has been an independent Catholic theologian and apologist for the last 24 years. His expertise is in biblical studies, theology, apologetics, and science. He directs Catholic Apologetics International, for whom he has written over 40 books and hundreds of articles for various newspapers and magazines, as well as participating in many formal debates to defend the Catholic faith. He has appeared on various television and radio programs, such as EWTN, CNN, the BBC, and Christian Broadcasting Network. He is also the chairman of Stellar Motion Pictures in Hollywood, California, and executive producer of the featured documentary film, The Principal, which appeared in Regal Cinemas in various United States cities in 2014. Robert holds a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in theology and religious studies. He lives with his wife, Maureen, and seven of his 11 children in Greencastle, Pennsylvania. On my right is Tony Costa, no relationship to Bob Costa. He's going to be presenting Mary, Sinner Saved by Grace tonight. Tony has earned a bachelor's and a master's in the study of religion, biblical studies, and philosophy from the University of Toronto. Tony received his PhD in the area of theology and New Testament studies from Rabot University in the Netherlands. His area of expertise is biblical and systematic theology, cults, the New Age movement, and comparative world religions with a specialization in Islam. Tony is also an ordained minister of the gospel. As a Christian apologist, Dr. Costa gives reasons for the valid belief in Christianity and also advocates the unique claims, advocates for the unique claims of Jesus Christ. He also lectures and debates at various universities and colleges on the existence of God, Muslim, Muslim Christian relations, as well as the credibility of the Christian faith. Tony is also a professor of apologetics with the Toronto, Toronto Baptist Seminary. He also teaches as an instructor with the School of Continuing Studies at the University of Toronto in the area of New Testament studies and Second Temple Jerusalem, Judaism. Sorry. He serves as an adjunct professor with Heritage College and Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario, and Providence Theological Seminary in Franklin, Tennessee. Tony is also a member of the Network of Christian Scholars in Canada. He has lectured throughout Canada, the United States, and overseas. He's the author of Worship and the Risen Jesus in the Pauline Letters, as well as a contributor of scholarly essays in Christian origins and Greco-Roman culture. Tony is happily married to a wonderful wife, has three children and a grandson, and resides in Toronto, Canada. With that, my name is Anthony Vini, and I'm going to be keeping time uh, for this evening's debate. I'll be the moderator. Um, if anybody has one of these, it's called a cell phone. Hold it up with your left hand. Come on. With your right hand, go over to this side and turn the ringer off. Okay? We have plants in the audience who will confiscate your phones in the event they do go off. You can retrieve them on eBay for a small donation. Okay. During the debate, we're going to have no clapping, cheering, or booing, booing during or after the presenter speaks. We'll have a time at the end of the debate where we can clap and applaud both presenters for what they've done this night, or done tonight. Defending the sinlessness of Mary will be Robert Sungenis on my left. Defending Mary as a sinner saved by grace will be Tony Costa on my right. Each presenter will have opening statements of 25 minutes each, followed by a 15-minute rebuttal. At that point, we're going to take a 15-minute break in which you will be able to go to the tables in the, in the hall, get an index card, and write out a question for each one of the, each of the presenters or both of the presenters, which we're going to do at the conclusion of their closing statements. Now... If you didn't go to Catholic school, please give the card to your wife to write out the question. Because I don't understand hieroglyphics, and usually most of the men who write out these index cards, something's wrong. So I'm not going to be able to read that. Anyway, when we come back after the 15 minutes, we're going to go through our second rebuttal. Each, pre each presenter will have 10 minutes to do a rebuttal. Then we'll go into the cross-examination. Each presenter will have 15 minutes to cross-examine the other followed by another 10 minutes cross-examination the other way. We'll then close with closing statements, five minutes each. Uh, Robert Sungenis is going to go first, and then Tony. At that time, we'll offer each participant a round of applause and collect the index cards. We'll do question and answer session from that point on up until 11 p.m. this evening. So those are the ground rules. Remember, hold your applause till the end. Please, again, another reminder, shut your cell phones. 
Robert Sanjenis is going to begin with his opening statements of 25 minutes. I think the first thing we should do is stipulate what this debate is about and why there is a controversy about it. This debate is about the fact that the Catholic Church, which claims to be the original and only one holy Catholic and apostolic church established by Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, has issued a doctrine which says that Mary, the mother of God in Jesus Christ, was conceived without sin and lived a life without sin. The Orthodox Church, to a slight degree, and the Protestant churches, to a much larger degree, disagree with the Catholic doctrine. More specifically, the doctrine means that A, Mary was saved from both original sin, the sin the human race inherits from the sin of Adam and Eve, and B, she was saved from actual sin. That is, she did not sin during her life on earth. A very important stipulation that many people miss is that Mary was saved from these sins not by her own power or status, but by a special grace from God, a grace that is based solely on Christ's death on the cross. Whether you are a Catholic or Protestant, Mary, being human, needed a Savior, which is why she says in Luke 1.47, My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. In other words, because of the universal curse of sin from Adam, Mary needs a Savior just like you and I. So the controversy between our different faiths and doctrines boils down to two issues. A, when did Mary receive the saving grace of God? And B, what is the extent of that grace? First, let's look at the actual definition of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception as stated by the Catholic Church. It was written by Pope Pius IX in the document Ineffabilis Deus of December 8, 1854, which the Church considers infallible doctrine. That is, all that it states is correct and without error. The document states the following, quote, To the honor of the holy and undivided Trinity, to the glory and adornment of the Virgin Mother of God, to the exaltation of the Catholic faith and the increase of the Christian religion, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own, we declare pronounce and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary at the first instant of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God in virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved immaculate from all stain of original sin, has been revealed by God, and on this account must be firmly and constantly believed by all the faithful. Wherefore, if any should presume to think in their hearts otherwise than as it has been defined by us, which God avert, let them know and understand that they are condemned by their own judgment, that they have suffered shipwreck in regard to faith and have revolted from the unity of the church. And what is more, that by their own act, they subject themselves to the penalties established by law. If what they think in their heart, they should signify by word or writing, or any other external means." Unquote. As we can see, the Catholic Church holds that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is no small matter. It must be believed under pain of excommunication in the present and eternal judgment in the future. So why what appears to be merely a peripheral doctrine, and one involving only Mary, and her personal status with God, does it take on such an important status 
with such ominous consequences? Let's begin by asking the basic question of why would God decide to give Mary the grace at the exact moment she was conceived, sparing her from original sin? The reason is very simple and very important. If Mary had not received this special grace of God, we would have no Savior, and thus we would all be damned with no hope of salvation. That is why the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is so important. Let me say that again in case you didn't hear it or understand it the first time. If Mary had not received this special grace of God, we would have no Savior, and thus we would all be damned with no hope of salvation. The reason is that the curse of sin, as demonstrated in what we call original sin, is inherited by the whole human race. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, contracted it when they sinned, and it was passed down to each generation thereafter as if it were a congenital disease. Simply put, if the mother has original sin, then her child will have it. We are stuck with it because we are Adam and Eve's children. So if Mary had contracted original sin from her mother, whom we know as Saint Anne, then in being the source of Jesus' human nature, Mary would have passed on her original sin to Jesus. If Jesus contracted original sin, he could not offer himself as a sacrifice to God and be our Savior, since in order to be a perfect sacrifice, the Savior must be a spotless lamb without blemish, a man without sin, either original or actual. As we can readily see, Mary's Immaculate Conception is absolutely essential in order to procure our salvation. Without it, we would have no Savior. A sinful Mary would have produced a sinful Christ in his human nature. Since Mary was the source for Jesus' human nature, she had to be free of sin so that she would not transmit it to Christ. We should also notice that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception says nothing about saving Mary from death. It only says she is saved from sin. There is a very good reason why their doctrine does not extend to Mary's death. If it did, again, we would have no Savior. In order to be our Savior, Christ must certainly be sinless, but he must also be able to to die, to be our sacrifice. As we know, there are two components to Adam's fall, death and sin. And there is a unique bond between the two. As St. Paul tells us in Romans 5, verse 12, quote, therefore, as death, uh, therefore as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sinned, unquote. In other words, the death we receive from Adam causes us to be classed as sinners and causes us to sin. But in order for us to have a Savior who could, on the one hand, be sinless, yet on the other hand, able to die in order to be a sacrifice, the bond between sin and death had to be broken. God chose to break it by allowing Mary to be conceived without sin, yet still retain the curse of death. In this way, the death part of the curse from Adam, by the special grace of God, was not allowed to produce sin in Mary. This was done so that Mary could not pass original sin to Christ, but Mary would still pass the curse of death to Christ so that he could die and be a sacrifice. As St. Paul says in Galatians 3.13, quote, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, 
Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Unquote. In other words, cursed is everyone who dies. In order to be subject to death, Christ had to receive the curse of death from Mary. If he had not received the curse of death, he would have lived forever and he would not have been able to die. And thus he would not be able to be our sacrifice to God. This was the very reason Adam and Eve were immediately barred from the tree of life, which if they ate after they sinned, would have made them live forever in sin, apart from God, which is the essence of hell. This also means that Mary, who had the curse of death, would also die. And this is why the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception does not say she was saved from death, only sin. This is precisely why the church, when it teaches that Mary was assumed into heaven, does not say that Mary did not die before her assumption. Thus it appears that the answer to the question of whether Mary died is that she did indeed die, and then was resurrected and assumed into heaven, just as Jesus died, rose from the dead, and ascended into heaven. And this is why the 1950 dogma of the Assumption says, quote, that she should be immune from the corruption of the tomb, and that in the same manner as her son, she would overcome death and be taken away soul and body to the supernatural glory of heaven, unquote. If that son believed she did not die, then God would have had to intervene with another special grace to spare her from death, just as he did with Enoch and Elijah in the Old Testament, and that is certainly possible. To sum up, we needed a sinless Savior to be the perfect sacrifice to God. In order to be sinless, Christ could not inherit original sin from Mary. But in order to be a sacrifice, Christ had to die. And in order to die, he had to receive the curse of death from Mary. In order to break the bond between death and sin, God had to give Mary a special grace so that, on the one hand, she would be sinless, and on the other hand, able to pass death onto Christ. As we can see, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is not some spurious belief that the Catholic Church just haphazardly tacked on to Christianity because, as some Protestants believe, the Catholic Church has a bad habit of adding things to the Bible that the Bible does not explicitly state. No, the Immaculate Conception is a superlative, logical, and inevitable doctrine that can be distilled from all that Scripture says about Adam's sin and what was necessary in order for Christ to be our Savior. Simply put, without the Immaculate Conception of Mary, we would have no Savior and no salvation. Someone might object that although the theological reason for Mary's Immaculate Conception seems quite in line with the biblical teaching on salvation, is there any direct evidence, a direct scripture passage for her Immaculate Conception? The answer to that is no. There is no direct biblical passage that says Mary was born without original sin and lived a sinless life. But precisely here is where we need to step back a bit. How do we acquire truth from God in order to determine whether a certain doctrine is true? The Bible is certainly a source for doctrine. As St. Paul teaches in 2 Timothy 3.16, quote, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, unquote. But there are two caveats to this. One, it takes proper interpretation of the Bible to arrive at what the Bible is actually saying. Unless the interpreter is infallible, this interpretation, his interpretation, will always be subject to error. Number two, neither 2 Timothy 3.16 nor any other Bible verse, tell us that the Bible is the only source of divine truth. In fact, the Bible goes the other way. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, the Bible tells us that oral tradition stands alongside written tradition, the written Bible, as a source of divine truth, stating, quote, So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our epistle. Unquote. The Bible also tells us that the church is another source of divine truth. As Jesus teaches in Matthew 16, verse 19, quote, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Unquote. If it is bound in heaven, and we all know that heaven cannot lie, then whatever heaven binds and is subsequently bound on earth by the church must be true and infallible, ipso facto. So let's reiterate the question. Since there is no verse of scripture which says Mary was conceived without sin and remained sinless throughout her whole life, does the church have the authority to formulate doctrine that is not explicitly taught in scripture? The answer is yes. Acts 15 is a perfect example. It is the quintessential paradigm for how the church is to be run. In Acts 15, the apostles and bishops were gathered to discuss the matter of whether circumcision would be required of Christians. After much discussion, Peter stood up and declared that it would not be required. Apparently, he had the supreme authority to declare doctrine for the whole church. But where did, this, did he get his information in order to make such a decision? He didn't get it from direct or explicit information in the Bible, since there was no verse in the Bible that said circumcision would cease when Christ came. A reading of Acts 15 tells us that Peter formulated the doctrine from his reasoning after God showed him years earlier that there was to be no more distinction between Jews and Gentiles, and thus no more distinctions like circumcision. Peter further stipulates that to insist on circumcision would be tantamount to disagreeing with what God decreed, namely that the only thing required from the Gentile was faith in God's grace. So we see that Peter made the doctrine based on his distillation of what he had learned previously from God. In other words, the tradition had been set and Peter followed that tradition. In the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, 19, what Peter bound on earth was also bound in heaven. And as far as circumcision is concerned, it remains as such to this very day. The next question is, would Peter's gifts of discernment and authority to make doctrine be transferred from Peter to the next leader of the church? Would he be able to do the same thing that Peter did in Acts 15? The answer is yes, and that is precisely what we see in church history. For example, the scripture never explicitly says there is a trinity in which three divine persons are in one God, one in substance, yet in three distinct persons, all equal in divinity and equal in power and glory. Yet our councils deduce this doctrine from the information in Scripture about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Church further condemned all variant forms of this Trinitarian doctrine and stated that anyone who did not conform to the Church's official doctrine of the Trinity would be eternally condemned. Likewise, Scripture never explicitly says that Christ was fully God and fully human, without mixture or confusion. Yet our councils deduce that truth from the Scripture's implicit information. The council stipulated by the Greek words that Jesus was homoousios, not homoiousios. That is, Jesus was the same as God, not merely similar to God. Scripture never says that Christ had two wills, a divine will and a human will. Yet our councils deduce that truth from Scripture's implicit information, and anyone who rejected it was condemned. The Council of Nicaea dealt with the Arian heresy. The Council of Constantinople dealt with Apollinarianism and Macedonianism. The Council of Ephesus dealt with Nestorianism, and so on and so on. Without the power of these councils to determine the truth, to bind and loose Christian doctrine, we would all be very confused and very heretical. Scripture never explicitly says that it's wrong to terminate the life of a newly conceived baby in the womb, otherwise known as abortion. But our church has deduced from the implicit information in Scripture that human life begins at conception, and thus it is murder to abort a newly conceived baby. I could mention many other such doctrines that are either not mentioned at all in Scripture or are only implicit in Scripture, but I think you get the point. So to recap our thesis, number one, the Immaculate Conception 
which is the fact that Mary was conceived without sin, was necessary so that Mary would not transmit the curse of sin to Christ, since if he was sinful, he could not be our Savior, and we would have no salvation. Two, the Immaculate Conception does not include an exemption from death for Mary, since she must be able to transmit the curse of death to Christ's human nature so that he would be able to die on the cross and be our sinless sacrifice to God. Three, the Immaculate Conception does not need to be taught explicitly in Scripture in order for the doctrine be to be true, since Scripture never claims to be the only source of divine truth. Four, the Bible and church history show us that the church throughout her history made specific doctrines concerning things like circumcision, the Trinity, the Incarnation, and many other doctrines only from implicit information in Scripture or information from tradition. Five, the Bible itself shows us in Acts 15 that it is the church alone that is to make the final decision on doctrine. And more specifically, it is Peter and his successors that have the highest power to bind and loose doctrines with the promise that heaven itself, which cannot lie, will likewise bind or loose whatever the church binds or looses. This is precisely what occurred in 1854 when one of Peter's successors, Pius IX, declared the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary and bound the whole church to believe it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. And with that, Tony, Dr. Tony Costa will begin his 25-minute opening statement. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank Chris Arnzen of Iron Sharpens Iron and all those uh, who were instrumental in making this event possible. I'd also like to thank Dr. Robertson Jenis for being here tonight in spite of his uh, condition being under the weather, and I count it an honor to share this platform with him in tonight's debate. In dealing with the question of the Immaculate Conception, I am going to argue against this position from two areas. Number one, the testimony of Holy Scripture, and number two, the history of the Church. Let us begin by first looking at the definition of the Immaculate Conception that was promulgated by Pope Pius IX in, on uh, December 18, 1854, in the bull Ineffabilis Deus. We declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the most blessed Virgin Mary in the first instance of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God, please note that, and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. Hence, if anyone shall dare, which God forbid, to think otherwise than as has been defined by us, let him know and understand that he is condemned by his own judgment, that he has suffered shipwreck in the faith, that he is separated from the uni unity of the church, and that furthermore by his own actions he incurs penalties established by law. Furthermore, the bull asserts, and indeed illustrious documents of venerable antiquity of both the Eastern and Western Church very forcibly testify that this doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of the Most Blessed Virgin which was daily more and more splendidly explained, stated, and confirmed by the highest authority. This doctrine always existed in the church as a doctrine that has been received from our ancestors and that has been stamped with the character of revealed doctrine. I will argue tonight that the document by Pope Pius IX, as it related to Mary, the Blessed Mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, is seriously flawed and is, in fact, disingenuous at best and should be rejected. I'm going to begin first with the scriptural testimony. It is clear from the testimony of Holy Scripture that all the progeny of Adam, all humans, have sinned and stand condemned before a holy God. This argument can be set forth as follows. Premise number one, all humans are sinners. Premise two, Mary was a human. Conclusion, therefore Mary was a sinner. Scripture is very clear on the universality of sin, both in the Old and the New Testament. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. 
Psalm 51, verse 5. And then, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. The testimony of Scripture is clear that all humans descended from Adam are conceived and born in sin with only one exception, the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture affirms about Christ that he alone was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, that he was without sin, Hebrews 4.15, holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, Hebrews 7.26, unblemished, he committed no sin, 1 Peter 2.22, and in him is no sin, 1 John 3, verse 5. He had no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And Jesus even challenged those of his day, can any of you prove me guilty of sin, John 8, verse 46. According to the Bible, Mary was a sinner saved by grace, like all of God's elect throughout history. She herself understood her sinful condition when she claimed in her Magnificat, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Luke 1, verses 46 to 47. It is understood biblically that whenever God or Jesus are spoken of as Savior, this always implies that the human is utterly dependent on God or Christ for mercy and salvation. For what does a Savior do but save? Now, the first thing that has to be noted is that Roman Catholic scholars themselves have openly admitted that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was utterly unknown to the first century writers of Holy Scripture. Thus, the Catholic Encyclopedia states, and I quote, no direct or categorical and stringent proof of the dogma, Immaculate Conception, can be brought forward from Scripture, close quote. It is no surprise, then, that any reader of the Bible realizes that very little is said about Mary outside of the Nativity accounts. The last time we actually read about Mary in the New Testament is in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 14, as she's in the upper room awaiting the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. After that, she disappears from Scripture. The book of Acts no longer mentions her again. She does not appear in the epistles of the New Testament or the book of Revelation, except for a vague and indirect allusion in Galatians 4.4 where Paul speaks of Jesus being born of a woman and also being born under the law. This does not mean that Mary was not important, but what it does mean is that she is not central to God's saving purposes. The center or focal point of God's purpose and glory is his son, Jesus Christ. All the law and the prophets and all the scriptures point to him. As Jesus said in Luke 24, 27 and 44, and beginning with Moses, and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. The gospel is about Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. And thus, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 4, the Apostle Paul delivers to us what is believed to be the earliest creed of the church. And there he states that this is the gospel that I proclaim to you. It is by this gospel that you are saved. And then he proceeds to define that gospel and says that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared. And this forms the heart of the gospel. And it's for this reason that the preaching in the book of Acts is all about the gospel. The apostles never mentioned the Immaculate Conception or the place of Mary in their gospel preaching because she was not the center of God's salvation. During Jesus' own ministry, a woman said to him, and I quote from Luke chapter 11, verses 27 to 28, as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And you will notice that throughout the Gospels, there's this emphasis on the spiritual family of Jesus. In fact, he even raises the status of his spiritual family above that of his own 
physical family. We're told in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, that in one incident, it says that Jesus' mother and his brothers came for him as he was teaching, and he was told, your mother and your brothers are outside calling for you, waiting for you. And Jesus says, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Who is my sister? And he turns to those who are hearing him, and he says, behold, these are my mother, my brother, and my sister. Tertullian made a very interesting observation. He said that at this point, he said, the Lord was, was hurt by the fact that his family was trying to take him away from his teaching ministry. And what he does is he rather uplifts those to whom he's addressing. He raises them above his own physical family in making them part of his spiritual family. Now, time does not permit me to keep going on on what Scripture says about this. The fact that the Scriptures are very clear on the universality of sin, and the fact that the Scriptures say next to nothing about the status of Mary, I think shows us that while she was blessed among women, she was not the center of God's purpose. She was an instrument, a means, but she was not the end in God's purpose. Now let's turn to the second plank of my argument, the history of the church. It is a fact of history, which is acknowledged by both Roman Catholic and Protestant scholars, that the Immaculate Conception of Mary was not explicitly taught by the Apostolic Church, that is, the Apostolic Fathers, or even the Church Fathers that followed them. For example, Roman Catholic scholar Dr. Ludwig Ott notes, and I quote, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is not explicitly revealed in Scripture. Neither the Greek or Latin Fathers explicitly teach the Immaculate Conception of Mary from his fundamental Catholic dogmas. Now, what is quite interesting is if you remember the bull of Pius IX said that this view of the Immaculate Conception, this idea has always been taught in the history of the church and has always been held to. But history bears something different. In fact, it contradicts the statement of Pope Pius IX. Because among the fathers, there were those who did believe that Mary actually committed acts of sin. Among them are people like Irenaeus. He cites the story of Jesus being approached by his mother at the wedding of Cana, where she asks him to turn the water into, or to provide something that is to provide the wine, etc. They're out of wine, and, and there, uh, Irenaeus goes on to, to argue that the Lord Jesus is checking her untimely haste when he says to her, Woman, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And then if you look at others like Origen in the 3rd century, he also ascribed to Mary high spiritual prerogatives, but he thought also at the same time that at Christ's passion, the sword of disbelief had pierced Mary's soul. And he believed that the sword that is mentioned in uh, Luke chapter 2, where Simeon says to her that a sword will pierce your own heart, he believed that this was actually the sword of doubt that Mary experienced at the foot of the cross. In the same manner, St. Basil of Caesarea, one of the Cappadocian fathers, he writes in the 4th century um, that he also sees the sword of doubt, which Simeon speaks about, as being that event at the cross where Mary was doubting Jesus Christ and his mission. Others, like St. John Chrysostom, accused her of ambition and putting herself forward unduly when she sought to speak to Jesus at Capernaum in Matthew 12, the story that I related to you, also found in the parallel in Mark 3. We also find this in Cyril of Alexandria. He also believed that Mary had committed acts of sin. So all of these fathers, by the standard of Pope Pius IX and Ineffabilis Deus, these fathers would be considered cut off from the church, because they actually believed that Mary committed sins. You'll notice that none of these fathers had an inkling of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. Now, some of the later fathers, like Augustine, came to believe that Mary committed no personal sins, but that she was still conceived in sin. Some believe that at some point following her conception, she was sanctified in the womb, or she was sanctified when Christ was conceived in her, or following the birth of Christ. However, Augustine and his teacher Ambrose did not believe in the, in the Immaculate Conception. Augustine writes, for instance, quote, He, Christ, Therefore alone, having become man, but still continuing to be God, never had any sin, nor did he assume a flesh of sin, 
though born of a maternal flesh of sin. Anne Augustine argued that the reason why Mary died was because she had inherited sin. And therefore, Roman Catholic scholar Boniface Ramsey admits, quote, we do not yet find the doctrines of Mary's Immaculate Conception and her Assumption in Ambrose. Church historian G.N.D. Kelly notes, he, that is Augustine, did not hold, as has sometimes been alleged, that she, Mary, was born exempt from all taint of original sin, the later doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, close quote. Affirming the same is Roman Catholic uh, scholar Peter Stravinskis, who said, and I quote, Augustine believed her to fall under original sin's dominion. And so what we are beginning to notice here, folks, is many of the fathers would be considered heretics by the standards of Pope Pius IX's bull, Nephibilis Deus. Now, it should be noted as well that it's not just Protestants that reject the Immaculate Conception, but Eastern Orthodox Church theologians have criticized the Immaculate Conception. In fact, some of them at the time charged it as a mere innovation of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it's quite interesting that in Augustine's debate, his famous debates with the heretic Pelagius over original sin, it's quite interesting. It was actually Pelagius who argued that all humans, including Mary, were immaculately conceived, and that the soul had no taint of original sin, as Adam's sin was not imputed to the human race, according to Pelagius. So really, when you think about it, Pelagius actually was a fan of the Immaculate Conception and argued he went beyond Augustine and said Mary was in fact Immaculately Conceived, but so are all the progeny of Adam. So when does this doctrine begin to formulate? Well, most scholars place it around the time of the British monk Edmer, his dates are 1140 to 1150, who was a pupil of St. Anselm of Canterbury, and he began to first write about the idea of the Immaculate Conception. In the 13th century, John Dunn Scotus promoted the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, and so did the Franciscan monks that continued to preach and defend this doctrine. However, it was vehemently opposed in the 12th century by St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And St. Bernard of Clairvaux said, well, if Mary could be Immaculately Conceived, well, why stop there? Why couldn't her mother be Immaculately Conceived? Why couldn't her grandmother be Immaculately Conceived? And so on and so forth. And also in the 13th century, the Immaculate Conception was vehemently denied by the greatest Western doctor of the Church whose philosophy the Roman Catholic Church still follows to this day, St. Thomas Aquinas, who in the 13th century also opposed the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception that Edmer and that John Don Scotus was promoting. And not only, John, not only St. Thomas Aquinas opposed this, but the Dominican friars also opposed the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. So once again, what does, this, uh, what does this reasoning come from that this has always been the faith of the church? If this has always been the faith of the church, then why is it that there is so much opposition to it when it begins to appear on the scene? We have to seriously ask this question, because I really find this disingenuous at best. Now, in order to force this idea of the Immaculate Conception, they also turned to Marian apparitions. They were even appealed to by both camps, both the Franciscans and the Dominicans, to argue for their respective positions. So, for example, St. Bridget had a vision of Mary who allegedly told her that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was true, while St. Catherine of Siena received a revelation that Mary was not Immaculately Conceived but was sanctified in the womb three hours after her conception. So now we have two canonized saints in the Roman Catholic Church teaching two contrary things. And if, 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 this, if, if this doctrine has always been the faith of the church, why has there again been so much contradiction in this area? And so here you have two saints canonized by the Roman church who received visions and revelations from the Virgin Mary, both of which contradict one another. But it gets worse. Another significant factor to be considered is that there has been a total of seven popes in history who have denied the Immaculate Conception. Now we're running to some serious problems in terms of authority and the successors of Peter. 
Seven of these popes that have opposed the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, Leo I, also known as Leo the Great, Pope Galatius I, Pope Gregory I, also known as Pope Gregory the Great, Pope Innocent III, Pope Innocent V, Pope John XXII, and also Pope Clement VI. Now, what do we find here? Once again, we find the New Testament has no warrant for this doctrine. The Apostolic Fathers, Irenaeus and others in the second century, did not teach this doctrine. The Fathers that came in the third century did not teach this doctrine. By the time we get to Augustine and Cyril of Alexandria and Cyril of Jerusalem, there's talk about Mary being sanctified sometime after her conception. Some teach it was when Christ was conceived in her. Some teach when Christ was born. Some teach shortly after her conception. But none of them taught an immaculate conception the way Rome defines it. No one taught that Mary was conceived preemptively before her soul was infused into the womb of her mother. And so when you think about this, we have to ask the question, why so much opposition? Now, before 1854, before this bull was issued by Rome, you have, you have to also understand that this was prior to Vatican I, which took place in 1870, when the doctrine of the infallibility of the Pope was officially declared, Vatican I, 1870. In 1849, Pope Pius IX was sending around his intentions to the bishops, archbishops and so forth, of his intentions to declare Mary to be the Immaculate Conception. And one of the dissenters of that proposal by Pope Pius IX to declare the Immaculate Conception was the Archbishop of Paris, Marie-Dominique Auguste Cibor. And Cibor opposed the idea of the Immaculate Conception because of the following, and I quote, because, it quote, could be proved neither from the scriptures nor from tradition, and to which reason and science raised insoluble, or at least inextricable, inextricable difficulties, close quote. So you notice the arguments are the same. Scripture does not support this. The tradition of the church does not support this. And in fact, Archbishop Sibor was correct. Now, one thing I want to make clear so that both our Protestant friends and our Roman Catholic friends are on the same page, the Immaculate Conception does not mean that Mary was virgin born. And in fact, this is one area where a lot of folks think that the Immaculate Conception, a lot of them confuse it with the virgin birth of Jesus. And they're obviously not the same thing. The Immaculate Conception does not mean that Mary was virgin born. The Immaculate Conception means that when Mary was conceived in the womb of her mother, she was conceived without the stain of original sin, so that her redemption was preemptive. That is to say, she was saved preemptively, whereas all other people are saved after uh, attaining original sin and, of course, uh, living and needing the grace and mercy of God. So we want to be on the same page here. We don't want to misrepresent each other. We want to understand. But I submit to you that the argument does not follow. The argument that is proposed by Rome, I think, is seriously defective. It is unbiblical. It goes contrary to Scripture. The Immaculate Conception is not explicitly taught in Scripture, nor is it implicitly taught. And you have to go through a great deal of semantic gymnastics to try to show it in there. And instead of uh, creating straw men, um, I will uh, wait to hear uh, Dr. St. Genesis' rebuttal, and then I could respond to any of his critiques. Thus, it is clear, according to the New Testament and the Apostolic Church and the Fathers of the Church, for the first 1,000 years of the Church's history, no one believed or taught the idea of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. And it was even opposed by seven popes, the alleged successors of Peter. This is a point that has been admitted by both Roman Catholic and Protestant scholars. The biblical view and that of the ancient church demonstrates that the dogma of the Immaculate Conception is false and should be rejected by any lover of scripture and truth. Mary was indeed blessed among women, but she was a sinner saved by grace to the glory of God alone. Thank you. Thank you, Tony.
We'll now begin our 15-minute rebuttal period, uh, beginning with Robertson Jennings. Okay, let's get right to it. Um, Tony opened up with a syllogism. All humans are sinners. Mary was human, therefore Mary was a sinner. Well, the problem with the syllogism is this premise is wrong. The premise is all humans are sinners. Obviously, if Christ was human and he wasn't a sinner, then he doesn't fit the syllogism. So the syllogism is illogical. It's a fallacy. Tony's final comment, and I want to start with that, was that no one believed in the Immaculate Conception. Well, I'm going to go through a bunch of fathers here and a bunch of councils, but I think it's important to understand that what is the, the truth is is that these fathers did not hold to the complete doctrine of the Immaculate Conception that was proclaimed in 1854. By this time in 1854, the doctrine had been kicked around by a lot of theologians, a lot of saints, a lot of councils, and finally came to the definition that was given to us in 1854, which was the complete understanding of the Immaculate Conception. Prior to that, there were seeds of belief. There were people who gave ideas of what the Immaculate Conception was, how it could be applied to Mary and Christ, and all kinds of ideas like that. They were formulating the understanding of it. They had the seeds of the belief in their hearts, but no one really understood because it's a very complicated issue. No one really had the correct answer to that question. Obviously, since Scripture didn't give us any information on it, and by the way, Scripture gives us a lot of information about Jesus Christ, but we all get confused about that too, don't we? Because we don't have one interpretation. We have thousands of denominations that give us each a different answer to what's even contained in the Bible. Can we imagine what it's like when the Bible doesn't really cover a subject and how we're going to try to understand what that doctrine really means? Tony said that Christ had no sin and he used this to say that well the the Bible is replete with information that Christ had no sin and says nothing about Mary not having sin. Yes, the Bible says that Christ had no sin, but that doesn't prove anything. That doesn't prove that Mary had no sin. Does the Bible say that, God, that Christ had two wills? Can he quote me a scripture passage that says that? Yet I believe Tony believes that Christ had two wills because our councils taught that. You'll, know, you'll not find a passage of scripture that teaches that. Tony said that the Catholic Encyclopedia says Mary's Immaculate Conception is not in the first century. So what? Tony must first prove that the Bible is the only authority that we go by. That's the, the burden of proof is on him. If he wants to maintain that because the Immaculate Conception is not mentioned in the Bible in the first century when it was written, well, show us where the Bible says that it's the only authority. And if you can win that debate, then you win this debate also. Tony says that Mary holds no central role in salvation. Let me ask you this. If Mary had said no to being the mother of Jesus, would we have salvation? If at her annunciation, the angel said, you shall bear the child of God, and she said no, 
we would have no salvation. Is that a central role in salvation? Does our salvation not pivot on what Mary's answer was going to be? Granted, she has not the central role that Christ has. That's a given. We never said that she was on par with Christ. All we said that was to produce Christ, Mary has to be sinless. Because if she isn't sinless, she's going to produce a sinful Savior. And we can't have a sinful Savior. That's the issue that Tony has to deal with. Not whether this father or that father or this pope or that pope talked about the Immaculate Conception. We already know what they said. And we already know what they finally dogmatized in 1854. What Tony has to deal with is, why do we have an Immaculate Conception? He needs to answer the question of, how is Christ going to be our sinless Savior if Mary herself is sinful? That's what he needs to answer. Tony talked about the incident where Jesus says, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Well, this has nothing to do with whether Mary was immaculately conceived or not. That is a special context in which Jesus is trying to teach the people that he has no favoritism for human relations and that his chief interest is bringing people into the kingdom. This in no way demotes Mary. Mary would accept this, and she did many times to allow Jesus to do his ministry. He says the church fathers don't speak of the Immaculate Conception. Well, I already told you that they don't speak of it in the same exact way that the Pope did in 1854, but they certainly do talk about it. We do have the germ of the idea in many of the early fathers. For example, with Augustine, he says, Now, with the exception of the Holy Virgin Mary, in regard to whom, out of respect for the Lord, I do not propose to have a single question raised on the subject of sin. Dealing with Ambrose, which is one of the fathers that Tony mentioned. He says in his commentary on the Psalms, a virgin not only undefiled, but a virgin whom grace had made inviolate, free of every stain of sin, unquote. I could go on and on. He says, Irenaeus says, Mary sinned. He says, St. Basil and Chrysostom and Cyril had problems with Mary possibly sinning. Well, the same Catholic encyclopedia that he quoted from says that these fathers do not constitute a tradition for the church. There were basically only five fathers who had doubts about whether Mary was sinless or not. But there were hundreds of fathers in the early centuries of the church. I can go down a whole list of them for you who were in favor of the Immaculate Conception. I already mentioned two of them. We had Theodotus, St. Proclus, Hezekus, Basil of Cilicia, St. James of Saru, St. Asestatius, St. Sophronius, St. Modestus, St. John Damascene. I could go on and on. I have a list here of about 50 of them. So when we're going to look at the fathers, let's look at, first of all, the fact that the church has no problem with the fathers disagreeing with the Immaculate Conception because it wasn't a defined dogma yet. The church holds that anyone can disagree with any idea they want to until the church dogmatizes it and makes it infallible. For example, the canon of Scripture. We had the canon of Scripture from the Council of Rome in 380 AD. The same Scriptures that we have today. But the church hadn't dogmatized it yet. We had other councils that confirmed that scripture. The Council of Carthage in 419. The Council of Florence in 1440. But not until the Council of Trent in 1563 when the canon of scripture was dogmatized and the church said this is the final seal of our authority that this is the Bible and there will be no books added and no books taken away. Could we never again argue with the canon? But up until that time, even saints in the Catholic Church argued what the canon was. 
Cardinal Cajetan argued that there were seven books that should be added or taken away from the New Testament. And he was right before the Council of Trent. Okay? So arguing or having misunderstandings or having doubts or anything doesn't mean a thing. All it means is the doctrine is being discussed. And sometimes those doctrines are discussed for centuries before the church dogmatizes them. The doctrine, of the, the doctrine of the Eucharist was one just like that. It wasn't dogmatized until the Council of Lateran in 1240. But the church had tossed this doctrine around back and forth for centuries prior to that. So all this talk about this father didn't believe this, it doesn't amount to anything. What he has to deal with, Tony Costas has to deal with, is why do we have the doctrine? What does it mean? And if it's so theologically incorrect, why? That's what I want to know. That's what you should want to know. How else is he going to explain to us how Christ became our sinless Savior? He also said that seven popes denied the Immaculate Conception. Again, they fit into the same category. Whether you're a pope or father, saint, theologian, bishop, it doesn't matter. You can question anything you want to question before that doctrine is dogmatized. And we would expect that to go on in the church. This is exactly how the church formulated her doctrine. This is what happened in the first centuries of the church. I mentioned earlier the Trinitarian doctrines and the doctrines of the Incarnation. It took the church centuries to finally dogmatize what those doctrines should be. The Arian heresy lasted almost a thousand years, even after the church dogmatized it. These things don't go away all of a sudden. But the discussion is for the church, so that the church can finally make a decision. That's why I covered Acts chapter 15. It says in the very chapter there was much discussion going back and forth between the, el the apostles and the, and the bishops about what the truth of this matter was. There was a big controversy that occurred. How was that controversy settled? It was settled once and for all when Peter stood up and said, the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. Case closed. And all discussion stopped. And as I said in my presentation, that's what happened in 1854. There were centuries of discussion back and forth about the Immaculate Conception, and Pope Pius IX, just like Peter, stood up and said, Mary was immaculately conceived. End of discussion. And that's what we need in the church. That's the only way the church can survive. If a leader of the church who has the authority to make doctrine stands up and says, after all the discussions in all the centuries of the church, we are now declaring and pronouncing and defining that Mary was immaculately conceived. So all that happened before proves nothing for Tony. Nothing at all. And again, the burden he has is to tell us why he thinks it's so theologically irrational to have Mary conceived without sin, if indeed the very fact that she's conceived without sin means that we have a sinless Savior, precisely to be the sinless sacrifice that God requires for our salvation. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And with that, Tony Costa is now going to give his first rebuttal of 15 minutes. Thank you, Robert, for um, that uh, enlightening uh, exchange and rebuttal. Um, let me begin first by uh, pointing out that the onus tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is not with me. The onus to prove the Immaculate Conception is actually with Robert. 
Because you see, as I pointed out, Roman Catholic scholars and Protestant scholars have always acknowledged that the Immaculate Conception is not taught in the New Testament. It's not taught in the Apostolic Fathers. I've pointed out the seven popes who are the alleged successors of Peter who've denied it, and Robert just dismisses it as unimportant. It's very important. These were men who were looked at as the successors of Peter, leaders of the church, and so forth. Now, let me begin with the syllogism uh, that I pointed out. All humans are sinners, um, and uh, Mary is a human, therefore Mary is a sinner. All I simply stated was what Paul stated in Rome, Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, this is not a fallacy. You see, the point is that if the premise is true, and if the premise is granted, then it's a valid argument, and the conclusion follows from the premise. Now, notice that I did not say that, um, that this would apply to the Lord Jesus Christ, because the Lord Jesus Christ was not just human. This would be the heresy of monophysitism, that Christ only had one nature. Christ is unique, head and shoulders above the rest, because he is the Deus Homo. He is the Anthropos. He is the God-man. And therefore, the universality of sin does not apply to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that that syllogism still stands. Now, Robert was saying that uh, there are seeds of belief. There are seeds going around, and there are seeds of the Immaculate Conception. Where are these seeds? Where are they? And, and, and has the church infallibly defined what these seeds are? The only two passages that Pope Pius IX alludes to is Genesis 3.15, which has been ripped out of its context, where the seed of the woman is clearly the Lord Jesus, not Mary who stomps on the serpent's head. It's Christ that, uh, that bruises the head of the serpent. And then Luke 1.28. Now, let me also address something else. He said, well, well, Christ had no sin. And that's true. He had no sin. And he said, but Mary passed on the curse of death onto her son. Now, that is a very theologically dangerous statement to make. Because you see, Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. And that means that if Christ died, then that means that he sinned. But here's a very important qualification that has to be made. What did the Lord Jesus say in John 10? No one takes my life from me. I have the authority to lay down my life. I have the authority to take it up again. Why did Christ die? Because he willed it. He willed it to die, to give his life up as a ransom for his elect. No, Mary did not pass on the curse of death to her son because he is the life. He is the resurrection. He gave up his life willingly, not because of sin, but because of his own divine will. Now he said, well, where does the Bible say that Christ have two wills? You see, the underlying premise here tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is that Robert is operating under the thesis of sola ecclesia. He does not believe in sola scriptura. He doesn't believe scripture alone is the ultimate authority. His ultimate authority is Rome. What does Rome say? And so, sola ecclesia is the underlying, the underpinning of his whole argument, that the church alone determines what is true. Now, he also said, well, can Tony explain the tools of Christ? I'd be glad to. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see very clearly there, he has a human will. Not my will, but thy will be done. Obviously, Christ has a human will, he can distinguish that human will from the will of the Father. But elsewhere he says, I have come not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me, to give my life for the world. And so theologians like Gregory of Nanzianzas and many others rightfully saw that Christ had two wills. But what Robert didn't tell you is that one of the bishops of Rome, Honorius, was a monothelite. He was a heretic who believed in the one will of Christ. And yet he was a bishop of Rome, teaching heresy. And what was the one thing that kept Athanasius going? What Robert did not mention is that Athanasius was exiled five times by the empire. Do you know that after Athanasius fought for orthodoxy? Do you know that the whole world turned against him? Do you know that even the bishop of Rome sided with the Arians? And this developed the idea of Athanasius contra mundum. It was Athanasius by himself against the world, against the bishop of Rome and others who had sided with the Arians. And what was his basis for the deity of Christ? He didn't go to church tradition. He didn't go to the Bishop of Rome. What was his basis? He said the scriptures, he said, these are the fountains of salvation. It is to these that we go to determine truth. What convinced Athanasius that the deity of Christ had to be protected was not church tradition. It was, in fact, the authority of the Holy Scriptures. Now, Robert said, well, what if Mary said no to God? We'd be in really big trouble. 
So the salvation of the world hinges on a human being. Now think about this. The potter is subject to the clay. The Almighty is subjecting himself to a creature. Think of that audacity when you read Romans 9 and 11, where Paul talks about the relationship of the potter to the clay. Now he says, well, if Mary said no, we would have no Savior. Well, let's suppose Joseph said no. When the angel said, do not fear to take Mary as thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Let's say Joseph said, nah, I'm not going to live with this. I'm going to walk away. You know what would happen? Mary would be accused of sexual infidelity, and she and her child would most likely have been stoned to death. So, why don't we credit St. Joseph? If it wasn't for Joseph, we would never have the marriage, and we would never have his custodial care of Mary. And, and see, see, folk, where does it end? What about Moses? What if Moses said no to God? I'm not going back to Egypt. I just came out of there. I'm not going back. You see, salvation is of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Salvation does not depend on Joseph's decision or Mary's decision or Moses' decision. It depends solely on the Lord Jesus Christ. How can Christ be sinless and be born of a sinless mother? Very simple. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And I believe it was Ambrose who pointed out that, that the way Christ could be born of a sin, sinful mother, maternal sinful flesh, is the same way that the light can radiate, a light, the sunshine that could radiate through your dirty glass window, that light could penetrate that dirty pane but still remain pure. Christ remained pure even though he was in the womb of his mother. There's nothing contradictory about that. And the Bible certainly does not um, see that as a problem. Now, there's a, a number of other things that... Um, that Robert mentioned, um, that sounded very convoluted. He talked about the, the Council of Carthage and things of that nature, but the Council of Carthage was not an ecumenical council. The Council of Carthage was a local council. Um, some of the other things that he also mentioned um, was that he said that, um, he said that uh, the scriptures alone, the scriptures are not just, just the only authority that we have in the church, but the Apostle Paul makes it very clear in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is theonostos. And the only literature that is called theonostos are the scriptures. They're God-breathed. And Paul says that these scriptures, these God-breathed scriptures, are profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, so that the man of God may be fully furnished, not partially furnished, be fully furnished for every good work. He points out to Acts 15, and it, it amazes me that not once did Robert say that the person who had the last say at the Council of Jerusalem was not Peter. You see, Robert is reading back into the text his presuppositions that Peter was the first pope, that he was the leader of the early church. If you read Acts 15, folks, read it very carefully. The one who runs the show in Jerusalem is not Peter. It's James. It's the Lord's brother. He's the one who stands up in the end and he says, I judge, and it seems good to the Holy Spirit. Now, he also says in the book of Acts 15 that we have an example of the authority of the church, but that's absolute nonsense. Acts 15 is Holy Scripture. Peter was an apostle. James was an apostle. Paul was an apostle. These are inspired writers. And they were led by the Holy Spirit to admit the Gentiles. And you will notice James quotes from the book of Amos, the prophet, where God says he's going to come and he's going to rebuild the tabernacle of David that, that has been taken down and, and that he's going to call from among the nations, he's going to call the Gentiles to his name. Well, think about it. If the Gentiles are coming into the kingdom and the Jews taught that in order to enter into the fold of Israel, you have to be circumcised. Well, obviously, if the Gentiles are going to come into the kingdom and they're going to be allowed under the new covenant, well, of course, God is going to reveal the setting aside of circumcision, not just circumcision, the Sabbath, the dietary laws that we see in Acts 10 with Peter's vision, and so forth. And so I think there's, there's a lot of reading into this. Now, Robert also uh, went on and he mentioned Matthew 16 about the famous, um, the keys of, uh, being given to Peter. And, and of course, that is not tonight's debate. The debate tonight is not over the papacy. The debate tonight is the immaculate conception of Mary. But even there in Matthew 16, there's, there's much diversity of opinion about what that means among the fathers. It definitely did not mean for Augustine that it was the Bishop of Rome and many others. But that same authority Christ gave to all the apostles in Matthew 18, where he gives them the authority 
to bind on earth what has already been bound in heaven and to loose on earth what has already been loose in heaven. And then he brings up the Trinity and says, well, look, the Trinity is not, is not explicitly mentioned. But Dr. Ludwig Ott says that in his book, Fundamentals of Catholic Dogma, that the Trinity is clearly manifested in the New Testament. In Matthew 28, 19, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Dr. Ott says that here the three persons are clearly identified as having oneness, the one name, but they're also distinct. So to compare the Trinity, which is oozing out of every page of the scriptures, with this doctrine of the Immaculate Conception is absolutely amazing and fantastic. And then he says, well, where does the Bible teach that God is, Jesus is fully God and fully man? Let's try Colossians 2.9. For in him dwells the fullness of deity in bodily form. Pleroma tes theotetos somaticos. The fullness of deity dwells in him in bodily form. What about John 1.14? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word was God and he became flesh. That sounds like two natures to me in one person. And we saw his glory. And he is full of grace and truth. We hear a lot of full of grace being attributed to, to Mary, but it's Christ, the incarnate word, who is said to be full of grace and full of truth. He is the one who is the rightful dispenser of grace towards us. And so you see, folks, you have to ask the question, what are the worldviews that we are operating under tonight? I've pointed back to the New Testament which I hold to be the whole Bible, the lively oracles of God. I believe that they have the last say in these matters. But when we listen to Robert, Robert will dismiss seven popes that I mentioned. He will dismiss various church fathers in favor of what? In favor of the church. And I submit to you the reason why we have all of these differences of opinion and all of these contradictions is because the Immaculate Conception is not contrary to Pope Pius IX, it is not a revealed doctrine. It is an innovation that was created in 1854 in light of opposition by others who disagreed with it, like Archbishop, the Archbishop of Paris, who argued that there was no justification for this. There is no evidence of this in scripture or in tradition. And Ambrose and Augustine definitely did not teach the Immaculate Conception. This is noted by Jan G. D. Kelly, this is noted by many other Roman Catholic uh, scholars. The view that Augustine held and that Ambrose held was that Mary was sanctified, sanctificatio in utero. She was sanctified in the womb after her conception. That is not an immaculate conception, ladies and gentlemen. And so when he says, well, who cares what the fathers say? Well, it's important to look at history. It's important to, to ask the question, what did these men think in the early period of the church. So much so that these are men who are recognized as saints, canonized saints in the Roman Catholic Church. And if Augustine was alive today, if St. Thomas Aquinas was alive today, if Tertullian were alive today, if Origen were alive today, if St. Basil the Great was alive today, they would be considered heretics by the definition of Pope Pius IX's Ineffabilius Deus. And that's why I rest my case on the solid foundation of Holy Scripture. It is Scripture that has been spoken by God. It is Scripture that is theanostas. It is the Word of God that is my standard. My standard is not the church to determine what is right or wrong. Isaiah 8.20 says, To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to these, it is because there is no light in them. God has given us a standard. His word is immovable. The heavens will disappear. The earth will vanish away. But the word of our God endures forever. And that is the standard that the people of God, like Athanasius, Cyril of Jerusalem, Cyril of Alexandria, Basil the Great, these were men who looked to the scriptures and used the scriptures as means to destroy the heretics. And that's why Tertullian said, Make the Gnostics go by what the scriptures say, because outside of the scriptures, all they have is their only opinions. Just like today, all we have from Rome are opinions. We need to return to the fountain of scripture.
Thank you. Let's offer a round of applause for both presenters. <clears throat> what we're going to do is break for 15 minutes, but before you leave, in the foyer, there's two tables set up uh, with books that you can buy from the vendors. They also have index cards there with pens. I want you to write out your questions if you have them now or hold on to your index card and write the question out when you're listening to the cross-examination. On the top of the index card, please indicate who you are addressing the question to. This is Robert Sungenis, Sungenisi, as far as I'm <laughs> concerned. And this is Tony Costa. So make sure you put on the top of that index card who you're addressing your question to. If there's no name on the card, I'm going to put it on the, on the back burner until we go through the, the cards with the names on top. Okay. So it's 8.40 right now. We'll be returning into this auditorium before 8.55. We're going to start at <laughs> 8.55 sharp. Thank you. Okay, let's begin to take our seats and prepare for the second half of the debate. Before we uh, begin that, Chris Arnzen is going to uh, step up to the microphone and just give a, a brief word. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I uh, hope that uh, you know that you have to put your question in that basket up there. So if you haven't done that, please do it as quickly as possible. <clears throat> and uh, if anybody of you could tell somebody in the lobby to, uh, or ever, actually everybody in the lobby to return to their seats. <clears throat> Everybody in the lobby, you're being summoned back into the auditorium. We are going to begin the final half of the debate very shortly, for the matter of seconds. <clears throat> uh, I committed a, an egregious error in the beginning of tonight's event, not theologically, but I <laughs> failed to thank somebody who is an integral part with my Iron Sharpens Iron radio program, uh, Mike Gallagher of Thrive and Financial, who has a booth out there in the lobby. Uh, it's amazing that I forgot to thank him when he actually is here with a booth in the lobby. But uh, Mike Gallagher was the very first local Christian businessman owner who believed in what I am doing with Iron Sharpens Iron radio. He is the first that took a financial risk uh, to bless me with being able to launch and proceed with the radio program, uh, knowing that he <laughs> might not get uh, any return at all for his investment, other than the fact that he knew that the Word of God was being defended and proclaimed uh, over the airwaves through Iron Sharpens Iron. And so I am very uh, indebted to Mike Gallagher and Thrivent Financial for their generosity and graciousness <laughs> and for, uh, as I said, believing in Iron Sharpens Iron when it was just in its infancy here in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Of course, as I said, I've been broadcasting since 2006 from New York, but I was a new kid in town here, and Mike Gallagher believed in me and what I'm doing, and I thank him again for his support. And I also wanted to thank uh, SolidRockerModeling.com, who is also in the lobby, <laughs> and they have been a blessing to Iron Sharpens Iron as well. But now I feel much better and, and can enjoy the rest of the debate without that looming over my, my head. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, with that, we're going to start our second half of the debate, which is going to begin with a second rebuttal by Robert Sungenis and then Tony, and then we'll move into the first and second cross-examination. Uh, the rebuttal time, second rebuttal time will be 10 minutes for each participant. Robert Stern. Okay, I want to refresh your memory on some things that Tony said, starting from the beginning of his uh, rebuttal. Uh, Tony said, the burden is with me, but I gave the theological reason for the Immaculate Conception. Tony has not given us any reason how Jesus could be sinless, 
coming from a sinful Mary. I would like to hear that before the end of the debate. The burden is on Tony to prove to us that the doctrine of sola scriptura is true when the Bible itself does never says it is the only authority. The burden is on Tony to give us why he doesn't believe Acts 15 is the paradigm set up by the New Testament for how the church is going to conduct itself. Tony also said the syllogism that he used was from Romans 3.20 that all men have sinned to come short of the glory of God. And he said that Christ isn't applicable to this syllogism, uh, but no, that is not fair. Okay, Tony did not give the exception ahead of time. Uh, he made a syllogism. He said that all men were sinners and then developed that syllogism to conclude that Mary was a sinner. But he forgot to mention that Christ was his exception. And if there are exceptions to the syllogism, then the syllogism is invalid. Relying on Christ's divinity is not going to help, because Christ had two natures. One was human, one was divine. The whole question here is, how does Christ's human nature avoid sin? I'm saying that it avoids sin by the fact that Mary was given a special grace to be sinless so that she did not transmit her sinful human nature to Christ, to Christ so that he would have a human nature that was sinful. Tony asked me about the seeds in tradition. Where are they? Well, he quoted from J.N.D. Kelly, and he said uh, that Chrysostom and Basel, according to J.N.D. Kelly, did not believe in the Immaculate Conception. But he forgot to tell you that J.N.D. Kelly, on the same page, says that St. Ephraim of Syria did believe, quote, Mary was free from every stain, like her son, unquote. He also didn't tell, us about, tell you about Hippolytus in the third century. Hippolytus said this, Mary was exempt from defilement and corruption. Again, Ambrose of Milan, I'll read him again, since Tony has a different uh, verse that he is quoting from. He says, a virgin not only undefiled, but a virgin whom grace had made inviolate, free from every stain of sin. Gregory of Nazianzus said, who had been first purified by the Spirit in soul and body. Theodotus of Achaira said, a virgin, innocent, spotless, free of all defect, untouched, unsullied, holy in soul and body. Proclus of Constantinople, 446 A.D., says, As he formed her without any stain of her own. Gregory Thermaturgos says, Thus the Holy Virgin, while still in the flesh, maintained the incorruptible life, being a pure and immaculate and stainless image herself. Fulgence of Rusby says, quote, Inasmuch as the Virgin conceived and bore the God of heaven and remained inviolate. Those, were the, those are the places that the seeds of the Immaculate Conception are. Tony talked about Romans 3.23. He says it was dangerous for me to say that death was transmitted to Christ from Mary because Paul says for the wages of sin is death. And if we say that Christ died because of that, then sin is the cause of that death. No, that doesn't tie together at all. I said God broke the relationship between sin and death with Mary. And it was death that remained, because Galatians 3.13 tells us that Christ was cursed with death, not sin. He was cursed with death so that he could be our Savior. Tony retorted and said that John 10, where Christ says, I have the authority to give my life, discounts that. No, it doesn't. What he means there is, is that he has the authority whether he will go to the cross or not. No one can force him to be the sacrifice, but he does not have the power to decide whether he's going to die or not. He will die as a human because he has the seeds of death in him. But he doesn't necessarily, nobody forces him to be the sacrifice. That's his own choice. He says, what if Mary said no? And then he talked about the potter and the clay as if God forces Mary to say yes, as if he has so much power over Mary. And this is the typical Calvinist position. That God is the potter in the sense he can force Mary to say yes. No, that is false. Mary has a free will. And if she said no, we would have no Savior. That is a fact. He talked about 2 Timothy 3.16, and he says, this is the only literature, that it's theognostus. So what? 
It doesn't say it's there that Scripture is the only authority. Of course it's theopnostos. It's God-inspired. I hope it is. Because I go to it every day for authoritative truth. But that very Bible, that very verse, never says that the Scripture is the only authority. That's what Tony has to prove. Not that it's theopnostos. The Bible, as I said, goes the other way. It's 2 Thessalonians 2.15. It says that oral tradition is also on the same level of, of authority as the Scripture itself. And then he talked about Acts 15. He says, let's look at who had the last say in Acts 15. It's James, because he says, I judge, and then he goes on and he gives recommendations, pastoral recommendations, that they should not eat this or eat that, and abstain from fornication. And this is a total misrepresentation of Acts 15. Total misrepresentation. Peter was the one who stood up singly and alone and said, there will be no more circumcision. Case closed. James then gets up and says, I agree with James. And here, as pastor of Jerusalem, I'm going to give you these stipulations to follow along with the major doctrinal decision that Peter just gave you about circumcision. And then he gives his pastoral decisions. So this whole idea that Acts 15, just because James has the last say means he's an authority, is a joke. Acts 15 puts Peter in charge and he makes a decision on circumcision. No one else. In Matthew 16, verse 19, he, uh, Tony says the debate is not on the papacy. Well, yes, in one way it's not on the papacy, but indirectly it is. Because it's the Pope in 1854 that decided that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was true and revealed by God. So in a sense, it is based on the papacy, because that's where we get our authority from. He said that uh, Matthew 16, 19 was no big deal because Matthew 18 also gives the apostles the power. But Matthew 16, verse 19 is the only verse that gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter. The apostles did not have the keys of the kingdom. So Peter was in charge of the apostles. Why else would Peter get up in front of all the apostles and bishops in Acts 15 and declare a doctrine in front of everybody and then everybody says, Peter has spoken. The matter is solved. And then James uh, comes through with his pastoral recommendations. He says the Trinity is mentioned in Matthew 28, 19. I didn't disagree with that. I said the complete doctrine of the Trinity about substance and co-equality and glory and all the other things that these councils define for us, they're not told to us in Scripture. We just have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so we know there are three involved, but we don't know exactly what the relationship is because Scripture doesn't give it to us. And then Tony says, well, when we talk about the two wills of Christ, he says, uh, two natures of Christ, and I didn't say natures, I said two wills. Okay? I also said two natures, but he sounds, he quotes a verse of Scripture and he says, it sounds like two natures to me. Well, that's exactly the problem. We don't need any more, it sounds like to me, because that's been the confusion since the church has started, with people saying, well, it sounds good to me, it sounds good to me, and he'll make a denomination, and he'll make a denomination, because it sounds good to them. But we need a church to make the final decision. Tony says about the uh, doctrine of Immaculate Conception, all this confusion is because it's not true. Really? How about the canon discussion? All those discussions they had throughout the centuries about what the canon was, the canon of Scripture. Does that mean the confusion over what the canon was means that it's not true? Of course not. It just means they had to come to a final realization of what the canon was. And they decided that at the Council of Trent in 1563, and there was no more discussion. Tony says that I said that we don't have to pay attention to the fathers. I didn't say that at all. I said there were five fathers who had some question or doubt about the Immaculate Conception. And I just read from you all the fathers that believed in the Immaculate Conception. So I'm not, I didn't say we didn't pay attention to the fathers. I just said that if they had doubts, the church doesn't matter. If they can have those doubts. And one more point. He said that, um, that they would be considered heretics. No, they would not be considered heretics. 
because the dogma was not defined until 1854. Anyone could have discussion prior to that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singenis. And with Tony Acosta's beginning to his, uh, begins his second rebuttal right now. Thank you again, Robert, for uh, that uh, exchange and uh, rebuttal. Now, Robert brought up the issue of uh, the syllogism that I brought up again, and uh, I did respond to the, the question about Christ and the relationship to Mary. Um, the syllogism that I stated is no different than what Paul says in Romans 3.23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, does that mean that Paul commits a logical fallacy because he doesn't know that Jesus uh, was sinless? Well, of course not. It's a given that the scriptures are very clear that Jesus Christ is the only sinless human being. And the reason why that syllogism can apply to us is because we are all sons and daughters of Adam, and therefore we are all sinners. And that would also include Mary. Now, Jesus, of course, was not. He is the last man. He's the last Adam. He is the Theanthropos, the, the God-man. He is Deus Homo. And so that syllogism cannot apply to him because Jesus Christ was not just human. That would be the heresy of monophysitism. Now, Acts 15, I, I challenge our, our uh, audience tonight to uh, read through Acts 15 and see if any of the things that Robert said tonight holds true. Uh, read Acts 15 carefully and ask yourself, do we see a papacy here? Does Peter have the final word? Or does Luke keep saying that uh, we, the disciples, the apostles agreed and, and we agreed? And then James says, I judge and it seems good to the Holy Spirit. And so the apostles uh, are in agreement together and the Holy Spirit testifies to that. The idea that there is a pope running, running the show is not present in there. Robert is simply reading uh, these ideas into the uh, scriptures. Um, now, the other thing that uh, Robert uh, brought up is that um, scripture is not the only authority. Now, the debate tonight, of course, is not on, on sola scriptura, but since uh, Robert brought it up, um, some of the fathers made it very clear. I mean, Gregory of, uh, of Nyssa said, let the inspired scripture then be our umpire and the vote of truth will surely be given to those whose dogmas are found to agree with the divine words. Uh, Irenaeus says, we have learned from none others the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel came down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public orally and at later period by the will of God handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. Notice the scriptures, not the church, is the ground and pillar of our faith. And then, of course, the famous Athanasius, who stood against the world and who stood against uh, Honorius, the bishop of Rome, who uh, held to monothelitism, he says this after outlining the books of the uh, New Testament in his 39th festal letter, he says this, and I quote about the scriptures, these are fountains of salvation, and they who thirst may be satisfied with the living words that they contain. In these alone, did you catch that? In these alone is proclaimed the doctrine of godliness. Let no man add to these, neither let them take aught from these. For concerning these, the Lord put to shame the Sadducees and said, You do her, not knowing the scriptures. And he reproved the Jews, saying, Search the scriptures, for these are they that testify of me. And uh, I can cite a number uh, of others. Ambrose said, For how can we adopt those things which we do not find in the Holy Scriptures. And so if you keep on uh, researching uh, the, the, the view of the early fathers on the Scriptures, it's very clear that it was the Scriptures that was their guide in determining what was orthodoxy and what was not. Now, um, Robert mentioned a, a number of fathers, Gregory of Nyssa and, and, and others, uh, regarding the Immaculate Conception, but my challenge to you is read these fathers, read them in their context, and what you find is not that they're teaching that Mary was immaculate before her, uh, at the time of her conception. What they're saying, as I pointed out before, that Augustine and Ambrose did believe that Mary was sanctificatio et utero, that she was sanctified in the uterus, that is to say, sanctified following her conception. I'm not denying that some of the fathers taught this after her conception, but they do not teach an immaculate conception, that is, that she was saved from the stain of original sin. Now, Galatians 3.13, it doesn't say that Christ, uh, that Christ was cursed. It says Christ became a curse for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Paul says that God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. And you'll notice here that Christ volitionally takes this upon himself, 
And so Mary could not have passed on the curse of death because Romans 6.23, which Robert did not respond to, says the wages of sin is death. Death is the penalty that you earn for sin. And therefore, if Christ uh, sinned, then he deserved to die. And this is why I pointed out that his sovereign uh, purpose in coming into the world was to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, you will note that when I talked about the potter and, uh, and the clay, Robert uh, misrepresented the Calvinist position. The Calvinist position doesn't say that God forced Mary to do A or B. Uh, we're not talking about um, a puppet master here. What we're saying is that God does decree things. God does decree the end from the beginning. But God uses means. And the means by which he brought about the incarnation was in his election of this young maiden, Miriam from Nazareth, to bring this about. And so we cannot overrule the decrees of God. They're biblical. And so it's not that God was uh, just you know, throwing the dice here and hoping that Mary would, would choose to be the mother of Jesus or not. And so notice he didn't respond to my, my critique about what about Joseph? Well, what if Joseph said, no, I'm not going to take Mary to be my wife. Does, does that mean that Joseph was, was more special than Mary? Does that mean that Joseph had God uh, by the short and curlies? Well, no, of course not. And so we cannot underestimate uh, God's absolute authority. Now, he did make reference to 2 Thessalonians 2, and he talked about the traditions in the church. But if you read that passage in context, read it carefully, the, the message, the traditions that Paul passed down, and that word parad paradidomi, is a technical word for transmission of information. He uses it in 1 Corinthians 15. What I received, I passed down. And what is it that he passed down orally? It was the gospel. That's how they preached, and that's how they spread the, the, the message, by oral communication. But then notice, as, uh, as we heard in, in uh, Irenaeus, uh, these words were written down later. Why were they written down? Well, as the apostles were dying out, they gave us their uh, witness in Holy Scripture that we have today. Uh, again, Acts 15, the interpretation that, uh, that uh, Robert has given tonight um, is not an interpretation that I find in any major commentary on the book of Acts, whether Roman Catholic or Protestant. Um, and, and besides, the Roman Catholic Church has never infallibly interpreted Acts 15 to mean what, what uh, Robert is saying that it means. Um, again, he brought in the papacy, the keys of the kingdom, and so forth. Um, but he does give the same authority to the apostles in Matthew 18. He says, what you, second person plural, what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's exactly what he told Peter. Now, Peter, of course, receives that blessing because he's the first to confess Christ as the Messiah and the Son of God. So when I said it sounds good to me, please don't, you know, Robert, we've got to get used to some sarcasm. It's a, it's a, it's a good thing to get used to once in a while. Uh, sarcasm, and that's what I was doing. I was simply saying, well, it seems, it seems to me, in other words, it, it's very clear in Scripture. I'm just employing a bit of sarcasm here, folks. Just, you know, it can, it, it, it can be a very dull event here tonight. So I'm trying to, you know, get things all spiced up. Uh, um, so, so that's what I meant by it sounds good to me. Maybe it's a Canadian expression or an idiom that Americans are not used to. Um, and again, discussion about the canon, I'm, I'd be happy to, to come in and debate Robert again on, on the subject of the canon and so forth, but uh, the canon is not the subject of tonight's debate um, and uh, the uh, canonization and the Council of Trent and, and so forth. But what I would say is the only thing that we have that is uh, authoritative, and the only thing that's called Theonostos is the scriptures. There's nothing outside of the scriptures. That's what the Lord Jesus appealed to. He did not appeal to the traditions of the elders that he called the commandments of men that nullify the commandments of God. He always pointed to the scriptures. It is written, have you not read what God has said to you? And so uh, I think that in order to establish what we're discussing here tonight, the Immaculate Conception, our first place is the scriptures. And then following that, see what the early Christians, how did they interpret these passages? And I don't think that they show that Mary was immaculately conceived. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And if anybody was uh, concerned about this debate being dull, that's going to end in about 15 seconds as we do our cross-examination. And it's going to be uh, Dr. Sungenis' uh, opportunity to cross-examine Tony Costa for 15 minutes. He's going to go first, and then we'll reverse it, and Tony would then be able to question Dr. Sungenis for 15 minutes. So are you guys ready? Yeah. Thank you. What we're going to try to do is um, limit Dr. Sungenis' question to one minute and Tony Costa's answer to one minute so as not to 
um, go on and on and on and and waste the other person's time. So we're going to try to keep that loosely to one minute each. If I see that it's going past that, I'll say, okay, let's go to the next question. So uh, are you ready, Robert? Uh, yes. Okay. So you ready, Tony? Yes. Okay. And let the time begin. Okay, Tony. Um, let's go to Acts 15. Mm -hmm. All right. So your contention is that the Pope is not present in this, and I will concede that in the sense that the word Pope isn't used there. But we do have Peter, after much discussion in verse 7 between the apostles and the bishops and all that are involved, Peter gets up in verse 10 and says his speech about the fact that God has taught him earlier that there's no distinction between Jews and Gentiles, that um, the Gentiles are to be burdened with nothing else but to believe in, the, in faith by the grace of God. And so why do we want to put a burden on these Gentiles to have them circumcised? And then it says the whole room was silent, and, and I think that's because the doctrine was established. And then St. James gets up and says, and I agree with Peter, and I judge that blah, 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 and they give pastoral recommendations as to what the Gentiles should do in order to um, coincide with what Peter has just decided about the fact that there won't be any more circumcision. So please tell us how you see that as not a paradigm for the church in which Peter is the leader, gives the doctrinal decision for the church on something as important as circumcision, and that St. James uh, plays a secondary role in giving pastoral recommendations for the churches. Please tell us how it is that you don't see this as a paradigm for leadership in the church. Well, first of all, uh, nowhere in Acts 15 does it say anything about Peter being the leader. Um, the pronouns uh, throughout the book of Acts are plural. Uh, they uh, use words like, uh, we should not trouble the Gentiles who turn to God and so forth. And the reason why the assembly falls silent in verse 12 is because um, they listened to Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs God had done among the Gentiles. And so I don't see here that uh, Peter has the last word on the issue. James judges, uh, and the Holy Spirit confirms the, the judgment that the church makes collectively. So I don't see any reference here, uh, Robert, honestly, to the papacy. And I think, I think this reflects what we see in, in, in First Clement, where we don't find a, a papacy. We see a a plurality of elders in the early church. Well, I, okay, I, uh, I will, on this minute here, I will say this. I think this is exactly where the problem lies. This is this mm -hmm. text is as clear as day. Okay. Is, this, is that a question, Robert? No, it's not. I, I, will, I will present the question to you. Just give me a minute, okay? This passage is as clear as day that there's discussion among the elders, the bishops, the apostles, Paul and Barnabas. Everybody's discussing this. Nobody has come to a conclusion. Can you form Peter, that? In the Can you form it into a question? It's Q&A. I, I still have about 40 seconds left. Okay. So um, uh, Peter stands up, gives the declaration based on what God has told him, and then the whole crowd is silent because he has just declared this dogma. Now, I'm going to ask you again. How is it possible that you can read that and tell me that this is not a paradigm for how the church's leadership is established from the get-go at the First Council of Jerusalem. Please explain that to us again. Well, I think I, I did, Robert, by, by pointing out that uh, verse 22, it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So I see a plurality of elders here. I, I don't see Peter having the final say. It, James is the one who ends the session. And what I see here is a, a collective... Uh, concert here among the elders of the early church, which is exactly what we see, for instance, in First Clement. And I don't see any um, commentaries on, on, on this subject. Uh, commentaries that I've seen both Roman Catholic and Protestant seem to, to agree with my argument. All right, let's try it again. Okay. You, your um, contention is that Peter's not said to be the leader. Mm -hmm. That is beside the point because he gets up 
He makes the declaration about circumcision. No one else at this council makes any statement about circumcision whatsoever. He makes the final decision on circumcision, and that is why the council was convened. That is why all these bishops, Bar Paul, Barnabas, and, and everyone else, even the Pharisees are there, they're all discussing this because everybody's in consternation as to whether the Gentiles should be circumcised or not. Okay? So Peter gets up and says, no, they shall not be circumcised. End of discussion. Okay, so what's we your should, question? Okay, so we, yeah, we should, we so tell me again why you think Peter is not the leader of this council that makes a decision on circumcision. This is going to be the last response to that because I think we, we've That's exhausted right. Okay, verse 28, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, and he sets out what things they Please are not to do. deal with the circumcision issue, uh, this, not the pastoral The circumcision issue has been answered by uh, God's revelation of the admission. Who was it answered uh, by? The admission, Hold let on. me answer the question. It's been answered by the admission of the Gentiles into the church. They quote from the prophet Amos to show that God was going to call the people for his name from among the Gentiles. Uh, and so uh, this was not something that Peter discovered by himself. Peter did receive the vision in Acts 10 and 11. Um, but he was not the only one that received this. The Apostle Paul was told by the risen Christ to go to the, the Gentiles and to bring them in. So I, again, Robert, I, I see a concerted, I see a, an elder, a plurality of elders here in the early church. I don't see a papacy with a magisterium. The plurality of elders did not make the decision on circumcision. That nope. is a fact. Okay, are, okay. We, are we moving on? I'll move on. All right. All right. Um, Tony, please tell us how Christ became a sinless sacrifice if he was conceived in the womb of Mary, who was a sinner. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He did not have a physical father, so he was not conceived in the same way that we are. And um, one of the fathers of the church, I'm not uh, sure if it's Ambrose or Augustine, uh, answered that question by saying that just as light remains pure, when the light shines through a, a dirty pane glass, uh, the, the, the dirt on the glass does not uh, corrupt this, this light. And so even though Jesus was born of a mother who was a, a sinner, he was set apart. He was uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit. He did not have a human father, and therefore the Adamic sin could not pass through his veins. Well, I would su submit to you that that's false. And the reason it's false is because he got his human nature from Mary. Uh, Joseph well, has nothing to do with this. I didn't say he, I didn't say Joseph did. I said he's let's conceived. direct the question towards yes. him. I will. Okay. I'm, I, I'm <laughs> going to you get turned I'm going to respond to what he says. This is this is a cross examination here. Okay. Yes. This is, I get to respond to what he says, and I will formulate a question. Right. So uh, the fact that Joseph is the father has nothing to do with. I mean, Joseph was the foster father has nothing to do with. The fact is, Mary was human. You're saying she was a sinner. We know, if you want to use syllogisms, that all humans are sinners, if you want to use that. Mary was a sinner, so and she conceived Christ, so Christ had to be a sinner. Okay? But Christ, tell, me, tell me how that could not happen. Because Christ's conception was different. It was not like our conception. Just because our it's different, that's not an answer. To the question. Give, give a our conception is between our fathers and our mothers, just like Mary's was. What I'm saying is that the conception of Christ was miraculous, was by the Holy Spirit, and it was that conception by the Holy Spirit that maintained his holiness. How do you know that? Because the scripture says in Luke 135, the Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the Most High shall overshadow you. Therefore, the child that is to be born shall be holy because of the Holy Spirit and his conception. I think it's very clear, isn't it, Robert? No, it's not, it's not clear at all. I mean, you're, you're, you're taking that verse totally out of context. And your, your whole premise is that Mary's a sinner, but she doesn't transmit her sin to Christ because somehow he's uh, conceived by the Holy Spirit and that mitigates the problem. But okay. we're saying the same thing for Mary. Okay. We're saying that the problem is mitigated by the fact that Mary, instead of Christ, is made sinless so that the sin isn't transmitted. All you're doing is Go now on. reshuffling the deck okay. and you're saying that Christ, it, it is a question. You're saying that Christ is it's a very long question. Going to yeah, it is because I have a minute to do it. Okay, you're saying that Christ now has received some special grace that prohibits the sinfulness of Mary to be transmitted to Christ. So all you do is reshuffle the deck. That's all okay. you're doing. So tell me that that's not the case. I'll show you. Let me let me let me quote what Holy Scripture says. 
Luke 135, And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, that is, because of this, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. I've just answered the question. The Holy no, Spirit... No, you haven't, because you haven't told on. us how that happens. Bob, I've, Bob, I've, I've Bob, explained... Warning number one. <laughs> I've explained how it answer. happens. It happened by the conception of the Holy Spirit. Luke 135 couldn't be any clearer. No, if you look 135 is clear, you're not clear. That's the That's problem. why I'm quoting is the that, scripture. Is that a question, Robert? <laughs> that's why I need that's I why I'm quoting the scripture. <laughs> Cuz I need the scriptures. I, you I thought this was going to be dull. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I already know Christ was holy when he was born. The question is how did he get that way? I, if you believe Mary was a sinner, then he could have not gotten that way unless the Holy Spirit somehow put a barrier between Mary's sin and Christ's conception. So you're, you're telling me that that happened somehow when the Holy Spirit enveloped Mary and, and mitigated this problem of Mary being a sinner being transmitted to Christ. Is that what you're saying? That's what Luke is telling us, that the Holy Spirit conceived the child. And because of this, the child would be holy, set apart. That's what the text okay, says. Where does the text say that there was a special movement of God to prohibit the sinfulness of Mary to be transmitted to Christ. It didn't have to because oh, the conception, it didn't have to. Oh, the, Robert, the conception Robert, of the Holy Spirit. Have, Robert, morning the conception number two. of the, Christ is the only Christ is the only human being conceived by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I know that. And that's why he is set apart, blameless and perfect. Yeah, that doesn't prove anything for you. Okay? Well, I can't you, prove it. God has to prove see, that to you. To just for everyone's understanding here, all that the Catholic Church has done is move it back one step. They have told us the reason why Christ wasn't going to question? be sinful, and I that's did. because Mary was prohibited from being sinful. I just want to make that clear to everybody. Okay. Um, you're saying in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, you said the word paradidomy was the gospel, and it was written down later. Uh, Paul says that in that verse that they are to obey the oral or the written. He gives no indication there that the oral was written down. Where are you getting that from? Um, let me turn to the passage again, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. What verse is that again? 2 Thessalonians 2.15. 2.15. Okay, let me just read it out. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So the letter, I presume, to be Paul's letter, which is inspired scripture, according to 2 Peter 3.16. Yeah. Where, and does, where does Paul say that the oral was written down? Well, he is saying that to stand firm, hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And Paul is clearly talking about the message that he had brought to them. But what you're missing here, Robert, is that the verbs here are in the past tense. They were already delivered. That is to say, this was the gospel message that was already. And so the verb there is not an ongoing verb, meaning ongoing action to the present, which would need to be the case if Rome's position was correct. What it says there is that what Paul has given to them has already been given either by word or written form. What did Paul proclaim to them? He proclaimed the gospel. So what? Okay, the fact is, Paul always preaches the gospel. Amen. The question is, in what method did he preach it to them? He says, I preach it to you orally, and I wrote it to you. I'm okay. asking you again, where does it say in the passage that Paul said whatever he said orally, whether it's past tense, doesn't make any difference. Of course it's past tense. He already gave those oral teachings to him. Where does it say that the oral teachings were put in written form? He is saying for them to obey what he had given to them, either in oral declaration or in written form. The question is, what was that oral declaration? That oral declaration, as, he's, as he mentions elsewhere in First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians, is the gospel. What else would Paul be declaring to them in oral form but the gospel? Yeah, I have no problem And would have to that. be given I orally said, before I, it's written. I, I will ask you again for the final time. Where does it say that the oral was put into the written? It doesn't say the oral was put okay. into the written. Thank you. What it says you is that them a minute. what it says is that the message that Paul gave to them, they were to obey, whether it was oral, meaning they heard him preach to them, right. or by letter that was given to them. Right. This is apostolic preaching, which is inspired preaching. Okay. Next question. Uh, you said that um, something. 
Uh, Galatians 3.13, I didn't quite get it. How much time? Do we, have? We, we only got 10 seconds left. 10 seconds. All right, I'll concede the time. Time flies when we're having fun, isn't it? Okay. I am having fun. All right. <laughs> now, Tony is going to get to question Robert for 15 minutes, and I'm going to issue another warning. Let's keep the question. If you want to hold it to a minute, let's hold it to a minute. Let's not pontificate after that. No pun intended. Let's not, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's not um, uh, preach. Let's ask a question, answer a question. I'm from New York Apologetics. I'm going to have to enforce this, all right? Okay? So get ready. You can start now, Tony. Uh, okay. Uh, Robert, um, does any inspired New Testament writer teach the dogma of the Immaculate Conception? You done? No. Okay. Number two, according to the book of Acts, which records well, the... Wait, 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 wait. Let me oh, just... oh, hold on a second. Stop it, stop it, stop it. <laughs> I just saw this something. I just saw this something. I'm going to give oh. you a special dispensation. All right, thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Okay. So are um, you responding to the first question? Yeah, I want to respond okay. to the first question. Okay. I will say no in the specific sense, but I will say yes in the general sense in this way. For example, in Luke 128, um, the angel visits Mary and says, Hail, full of grace. Okay. Uh, this is the Greek word kerikotomene, which is a um, past perfect participle. And what this is saying is that it's, a, it's like the Indians used to call their new, newly born child you know, running deer because they saw a deer running when the child was born. Ten seconds. Wrap okay. it up. Ten seconds. I just you just use fifty. All right. Well, the fact is, that, okay. Sorry, I thought you wanted to make this a debate here. Okay, I'm just I I I, I thought I restarted my question or my answer, and I thought you were going to restart. Let's the move time. to the next question. Tony, ask. Okay. Um, I was getting just getting ready to to deal with Luke one twenty eight. Okay. Um, let me get to the second question. Um, so, so Robert, you've been spending a lot of time on the book of Acts, uh, particularly chapter 15. Uh, according to the book of Acts, which records the preaching ministry of the apostles, the early church, uh, when did the apostles ever mention Mary and her role in God's salvation plan in the book of Acts? They don't, and that's irrelevant. Okay. So they, uh, in the book of Acts, you would agree that what they preached was the gospel of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, never said he did, they didn't. Okay, so that was the gospel that they preached in the book of Acts. I don't know what your point is. Well, that they preached the good news of Jesus Christ's death, burial, resurrection. Of course. To give salvation to the world. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there... Um, where is the clearest mention made of the Immaculate Conception, and what is the time period? Clearest mention of the Immaculate Conception in the church, church's history. What is the time period? The clearest is 1854, when the dogma was given. So for 1850 years, uh, God had not given a clear revelation about the status of Mary, um, who is believed to be uh, essential in the salvation of the world. Apparently so, but God had uh, not given clear revelation about a lot of things. There's a lot of things the church struggled with for centuries. Uh, you could say the same thing about the Trinitarian and Incarnation doctrines that I mentioned in my uh, response to you. It took the church four centuries to figure those things out. And when she finally figured them out, she still didn't understand them. All she could tell you was what you couldn't say about the Trinity and the Incarnation. Not what they really were, because no man can really fathom what they are. But it took the church four centuries to make these doctrines, okay? So are we going to say the same thing? When, when's the clearest uh, 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 pronunciation for the doctrine of the Trinity? Well, it actually didn't come till the Council of Ephesus or the Council of Chalcedon, almost four centuries after Christ appeared on earth. So if you want to make the point, they, the sword cuts both ways there. So prior to the councils, you're saying that uh, the... Uh, the first century Christians did not know that God was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? No, I didn't say that. I said the doctrine of the Holy Trinity is a complex doctrine, dealing with substance, dealing with uh, glory, dealing with power, 
dealing with relationships between the Trinitarian personages, all those kinds of things. You've read the documents. I don't have to tell you. You know, it's not just saying there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have to know the intricate details of how all those things relate. Otherwise, you're in heresy. There were some people who said, well, the, the Father was this and the Son was this. Son was this. Uh, uh, the, the, the Trinity was just three modes of existence. That was Sibelianism, and that was a heresy. But it sounded real good to the people. Well, you know, we can't, we can't understand that there's three persons in one God, so let's just make them modes of existence. Well, that sounded real good to them. But it was flat wrong, and the church said that. And it took them a long time to reach that point, okay? So, I mean, I don't think you're making a... So, so what you're saying is that, uh, do you realize that whenever creeds were published, like the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedon Creed, they were always uh, responses to heretical movements that were challenging historic Christianity? Of course. And so doesn't that presume that if, they are, uh, if the church uh, published the Nicene Creed, does, not, does that not show that the church already held to the deity of Christ, as we see in Ignatius and Irenaeus, that what the church was basically doing, Robert, was uh, countenancing uh, heresy and the false notion of who Christ was. What? The church was countenancing heresy? Count they, well, the Nicene Creed was a response to Arianism that taught that Christ was a creature. Yeah, but that was in 325 A.D. That's it was. three centuries after it, Christ. It, it was, and what prompted that, of course, was the, was the uh, uh, Arian heresy, is what prompted the Nicene Council. My, my point is, uh, Robert, in Hebrews 1.3, and this is a question, uh, we're told there about the Son that he is, uh, it says there that he has the character, the imprint of the hupostaseos, the substance, the nature of God himself. Doesn't that passage clearly teach that Christ is of the same nature as the Father? Yeah, I hope it does. But whether they were easy, they, whether they could understand at that time and didn't have any arguments to the contrary, and you can read the commentaries, there are arguments to the contrary of that. We're no different than they were back in the first century. But who's going to make the final decision on those controversies? The church is. That's the only entity that existed to make the final decision. And that's why I keep coming back to Acts 15. Acts 15 is the paradigm for this because it tells us that there's one man who stands up, makes the decision on this major doctrine, as the, happened in all the councils. The Pope approved those councils, and those councils confirmed the doctrine, and that's why we believe them today. That's why you believe them today. That's why you can carry your Bible around today, because you have the canon of scriptures that the Catholic Church gave to you from all its councils that decided what those books were going to be, okay? So, you, you know, you take what you want, and, you, and then you leave the rest, and you try to criticize it, but you can't do that. If you're going to take it, take the whole ball of wax. So, so, uh, so Robert... Um um, in, in, regards to, in regards to the claim about Acts 15, uh, is that your own opinion, or has that text been uh, infallibly interpreted by Rome? No, it hasn't been infallibly interpreted by Rome. Rome so what, hardly interprets uh, many scriptures. So your interpretation is just your own. It's your own private interpretation. It doesn't make it wrong. I'm not if, saying it makes it wrong. If you want to make it wrong, then tell me why Peter standing up and giving the decision is not a paradigm for the church leadership. So, so this is your opinion, not, not the infallible It doesn't make any difference whether it's my opinion. If you think it's wrong, tell me why it's wrong. Well, okay, I, I think I did. I'm, I'm the one asking the questions right now, so uh, you could ask me that during the, the Q&A period. Um, how, does the, the, uh, how does the Immaculate Conception of Mary uh, fit into the, the biblical definition of the gospel? I already said that, and I made, it very, I made it crystal clear in my presentation, which was the fact that if Christ is going to be our Savior, he has to be without sin. There is no way he can be without sin if he's born with the human nature that he got from Mary, if Mary is sinful. Unless somehow God intervenes and prohibits Mary's sinful human nature from being transmitted to Christ's human nature. If it is, he's not a Savior. If it is, if it is mitigated, then he becomes our Savior. That's how Mary is integral with the gospel. Well, if, it's, uh, if that is so integral, as you pointed out, then why is it that the scriptures do not clearly teach that, as it teaches the sinlessness of Christ? Because you're assuming the scriptures have to, have to uh, explicate on every wrinkle of every doctrine that we need for Christianity, and that is a false premise. Okay, you need to prove that first, that Scripture has to cover every single detail of our Christian faith in order for us to believe it. If you can do that, as I said, you win the debate. If you can't, 
you're in trouble. Well, I think I did demonstrate that uh, by pointing out that um, Scripture does tell us that it is the standard by which we are to judge. Um, Where? Old false Where does Scripture say that? Uh, Robert, you can ask him that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, in Isaiah 8.20, we're told that to belong to the testimony. If they don't speak according to these, that there is there's no light in them. Um, Where does Scripture so, say no, it's the only Robert, authority? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. he's questioning you, your answer. All right, well, then give me a question then. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, I'm leading up to that. Okay, so so I, I'm I'm still trying to understand this, uh, Robert. That um, the, do, the the dogma of the immaculate conception took over 1,850 years for God to reveal this to the church. Um, and so what you're saying is, for 1,850 years, the church was left without this understanding of Mary's immaculate conception. Are you asking me a question? Yes. Yes, uh, what Ask I'm asking is, why, why is it that the Immaculate Conception is a doctrine that the church had to wait for for over 1,850 years? All right, well, let me answer that with a question. Why did we have to wait four centuries for the doctrine of the Incarnation and the Trinity to be settled in church dogma? You want me to answer was that? God no. To, was God <laughs> depriving us? No, I don't I'm not done. To, I still have 30 seconds. Yeah. I okay. don't want him to answer that, though. Okay, don't answer. That's the moderator. You can great, ask me great, that. Great. <laughs> Okay, right. good. So I get to, you're I, going to go I, back the other way. I get, Don't my, worry. <laughs> I get to finish my answer. You see, the premise you're working on is that if there's a long time factor before the dogma is settled and becomes dogma, that somehow uh, mitigates it as being uh, trustworthy or uh, believable or whatever. No, that is a false premise. There is no time factor involved. And we can prove that by the fact that most of the doctrines that came in church history took a very long time to settle, okay? Okay. So, wait, wait a minute, I'm not done my answer yet. So, uh, the fact that you're trying to say that 1854, and you make it sound as if this was the first time that this sort of thing, that this dogma appeared, no. It, it appeared 400 okay. years earlier at the Council of Florence. It, it appeared at the Council of Toledo and the Council of, um, um, uh, I forget the, uh, in the 600s, okay? These... They were, they were thinking about it. They were formulating it. They just hadn't completed it. And they did so in 1854. So in Jude 3, where we're told that we are to contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, what is that faith that has been once for all delivered to the saints? The gospel in the scripture, in the tradition, what the Catholic Church calls apostolic tradition, and settled by the church as Acts 15 shows us the paradox. That is what's settled. After that, then the church has to figure out all these other contingencies that are associated with the uh, with the, with Scripture. Okay. For example, Christ's identity, the Holy Spirit's identity, how they all work together, and all these other doctrines. So when Jude, uh, who is an inspired writer, when the Holy Spirit made, uh, has Jude write that the, the faith is hapax, which, which means a once-for-all act, that this faith, this positive faith, has been given to the church once for all, what you're saying is that the church still needs the tradition to continue. Well, that's, that's what Acts 15 tells us, you see. Because if it was in your definition of once for all, that means Peter should have had no problem. He should have been able to flip through the Bible and say, ah, here, circumcision ceases when Christ comes. There is no passage of Scripture like that. So what he has to do is go back to the tradition of what God taught him in Acts chapter 10, and reason it out with his, uh, with his mind, guided by the Holy Spirit, and presents now this doctrine that circumcision will not be required of the Gentiles. Okay. You ask me that question, I'll answer it in the, in the follow-up. Um, so, so what you're saying, uh, Robert, is that this, this ongoing tradition in the church, you would place that as revelation on the same level with the, uh, with the Bible? This ongoing That's what revelation. St. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, well, he uses which is the, why I told you. You want to let me answer? Yeah, yeah okay. go ahead. So that, that's why I went back to that passage for you. I asked you where Paul said the oral tradition was eventually written down. You couldn't show me it. I, I, told, I stipulated to you that Paul speaks about two sources of revelation there, the oral revelation and the written revelation. That's plain as day. So if you're asking me, do I depend on the tradition? Yes, because that's what the Bible tells me to do. So, Robert, what is the difference between uh, Pope Pius IX claiming that he had new revelation from God in 1854 and the claim by the Mormon Church that Joseph Smith received uh, the Book of Mormon 
in 1830, and that this was a continuing revelation, as the Mormon Church also believes. What is the difference between those two views? The difference is he didn't use the word new. You just threw that in there. He didn't say this is new revelation from God. He said this is revealed by God. And I already pointed to a passage in Luke 128, which says Mary was full of grace. Well, how are we going to interpret that? Who, who has the authority to interpret that passage? The church does. And why do we know that? Because Acts 15 tells us that the church has the authority. Matthew 16 tells us the church has the authority to bind and loose on doctrine. And so when they look at Luke 128, and they see Mary full of grace, their interpretation is, well, that means Mary was full of grace in the past and to the present, which means she was immaculate. That's their interpretation, and they have the authority to do so. Okay. That was the first cross-examination. We'll move into the second cross-examination where uh, Robertson Genesis is going to question Tony Casa for 10 minutes. Are you ready? I'm doing good. Yeah, you're doing well. <laughs> Just keep it under wraps. Okay. Ready? Go. All right. Here we got 10 minutes on this one? 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Um, have you ever read my book, Not by Scripture Alone? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. I think you should read it. And the reason for that is this. Um, you mentioned quite a few fathers, and you quoted from their passages and made it sound like they believed in Sola Scriptura. Um, I would like to challenge you, and this is just off the cuff here, I would just like to challenge you, because I cover each of those fathers that you quoted in my book, in the book 600 pages long, I will give you a question. Hold on one second. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, um, if, would, so here's the question to you. Would you read that after this debate? <laughs> would I read it? Uh, yeah. Well, after reading all the other ten books, I got to catch up on. I would, if you have, if you have your book, I'll be more than happy to read it. Yeah. Uh, uh, would you accept a book if I uh, sent it to your address? Absolutely. Great. Okay, so I will get. I'll your accept address. any freebies. Okay. All right. Now I wanted to do. I'm with... good to receive one too. <laughs> will you be nice to me? And I'll give you one. <laughs> I have one. All right. Let's go back to this uh, uh, issue of Galatians. Uh, or Romans 6, uh, 23. All sin come short of the glory of God. And your syllogism, okay? Um, you said that Paul, who was it? You said that Paul didn't make, oh, you said, is Paul at fault for not uh, making Jesus an exception to this Romans 6, 23? Remember that? Yes. Okay. Here's the problem with that, and I'm going to ask you to rectify it. Um, Paul didn't make a syllogism. You made the syllogism. Paul didn't make a syllogism that says, all men are sinners, Mary was a man or a human, and therefore Mary is a sinner. Okay? He didn't make that syllogism. In a, would you agree with me that Paul is in a certain context in Romans chapter 6 regarding sin that's not dealing with Mary? What's the question? Can you repeat that? I said, would you agree with me that Romans 6 is a context that's dealing with sin and not dealing with Mary? It's dealing with sin in the context of its universality in the human race, yes. Yeah. Do you believe there's exceptions to that? Yes, Jesus Christ. Okay. Fine. You believe that there are exceptions to people who um, will die? There are uh, exceptions. Uh, we have examples of that in Enoch, in Genesis 5.24. Okay. And we also see that in 2 Kings 2 with the prophet Elijah. All right. So why does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, mm -hmm. as in Adam all die, as in Christ all shall be made alive? Paul there is dealing with the resurrection. And right. he is showing that those who have their federal uh, headship under Adam will die. And those who are under the federal headship of Jesus Christ will be made alive again. All right. Well, didn't Enoch and Elijah, weren't they under the federal headship of Adam? No, they were elect of God. They were chosen in Christ from the foundation of the world. Wait a minute. Okay. You're telling me that Enoch and Elijah were not under the federal headship of Adam? No, they were not because they were elect of God. And did they receive original sin? Yes, they did. Where does original sin come from? It comes from Adam. 
So how were they not under the headship of Adam? Because they were elect of God. They were chosen by what God. What does the elect of God have to do with ha having original sin transmitted to you? It has to do with God's election in salvation. And uh, Enoch and Elijah were chosen by God. And all the saints of God are in Christ, even the Old Testament saints. Yeah, well, so, uh, you know, I think you think you're elect of God, but does that mean that you're not under the federal headship of Adam? No, I'm not in Adam. Uh, Paul clearly says in Romans 5 that those who are in Adam shall die, and those who are in Christ shall live. Okay. And so I've come under the new headship of Jesus Christ. Oh, you've come under it? Yeah. That's well, we're, that's not what we're arguing. We're arguing whether you were at one time under the federal headship Absolutely. of Adam. Okay, were Enoch and Elijah at one time under the federal headship? At one headship? time they were. Okay, well, yeah, you should have clarified that. All right, so if that's, the case, if that's the case, why did you say that Enoch and Elijah uh, did not die because they were not under the federal headship of Adam? What I said was Enoch and Elijah did not die. They were translated. I didn't say translated, but they were taken out. But the reason for that is because they were uh, part of God's elect. Yeah, but I don't, I'm not going to have that happen to me. I'm, not going to, I'm going to die and not be assumed into heaven without dying. So if, if I'm under the federal headship of Adam and Enoch is, is also, why is Enoch allowed to be assumed into heaven and not die but not me? Or well, I, I, I said that Enoch was under the headship of Adam, but he was chosen, which would have brought him under the headship of Christ. Yeah, well, I'm under the headship of Christ also. Yeah. So why am I not going to be assumed into heaven well, without because dying? Because the, the assumption of uh, Enoch and Elijah were things that were determined in the plan of God. God did not say that uh, so many people would be uh, assumed into heaven. Enoch and Elijah were given that, uh, that, that privilege by God. Yeah, okay. So do you, would you say that they were then exceptions to the general rule? The people die and, and uh, go into the grave? Well, I, I believe that uh, when Christ returns, we're, we're clearly told there that the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive will be changed uh, in the twinkling of an eye into glorified immortal bodies. I believe that at that time, Elijah and Enoch will also experience the same change as, as the saints of God will in the resurrection. Wait a minute. The passage says that Enoch went into heaven and Elijah went into heaven. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say anything about them coming back and be and being raised again or anything of those passages I didn't that you say quoted. That. Okay, well, I'm, I'm kind of confused about what you're saying, so well, I want to get to it. My, my question it was, you. would you consider Enoch and Elijah exceptions to the general rule that as in Adam all die? They were exceptions to the rule in the sense that they did not physically die. What I'm saying is they were under Adam's headship, and then they came under Christ's headship. They were elect of God. And they were given that, that uh, particular blessing. Okay, under the federal headship of Christ, were they exceptions to the fact that people, that people generally die and go into the grave? Whatever were they exceptions in the sense that they did not die? Yes. Okay, so the, the point is made then, which I, I've been trying five minutes what's, to get to, point? is that there's exceptions to the general rule. So if you're going to use Romans 620, where, where, where um, Paul says, all have come short of the glory of God, that's qualified. Of what, uh, what other uh, information does the Bible give us or tradition give us or, or, or it comes from other sources that we have to examine what the context is of what Paul is saying? In the context, yes, I would agree with you. All that Paul are talking about are, are sinners that come short of the glory of God. But it doesn't deal with the exceptions, just like when uh, 1 Corinthians 15.22 says that as in Adam all die, Enoch and Elijah are exceptions to that. Okay. okay. You can explain so, that if you want. Well, I'll explain it uh, by saying that the scripture, I think what you're trying to get at, get at here is that Mary was also an exception. But the scriptures do not teach that. What I'm going on is what Scripture says about yeah. Enoch and Elijah. That I understand what, that. That is what we have in revealed Scripture. Yeah, but to see the problem but, but, keeps but, coming back to the same thing as you keep relying on Scripture as your only authority. Yes, absolutely. And you have to prove that. You can't use it as a premise yes. unless you prove it first. Is that a question? Though? Yes. Okay. Where in Scripture does it say the Scripture is the only authority? That's the question. I think I quoted that with for, with 2 Timothy 3.16. Where does 2 Timothy 3.16 because say the Scripture is the only authority? Because it says that all Scripture is theonostos. It is God-breathed. And because it is God-breathed, it is profitable for teaching, for correction, for reproof, that the man of God may be fully furnished to every good work. 
Yeah, I know what the so, verse so, says. So, I'm asking you where you think it says that it's the only authority. Well, I mean, that is just one among many other texts. There's what? Many, there's many texts. What text is there? That was the text that you gave to answer my question. So show me where in that text it says Scripture is the only authority. I think I just did by, no, quali by qualifying okay. it with okay. Theonostos. Theonostos doesn't breathed. mean anything. It does. Theonostos it means, God means God breathed. Yep. We all know that. And that's it does important. not mean only Scripture is the authority. The, the clear consistent message throughout the scripture is that the word of God is the standard by which we follow. Jesus held people of his day accountable for what scripture said to them. Tony, you can make Jesus, all the assertions you I, want. I'm not finished. Okay. I'm not finished. Jesus constantly pointed to the scriptures in his ministry. He did not, when he was confronted with the traditions of the elders, he told them that the traditions uh, nullified the word of God. They nullified the commandments of God. And Jesus pointed back to the scriptures. Yeah, I know as the that, foundation, but Jesus of never the said the scripture alone was the authority, and he was pointing he, to corrupt tradition. Saint Paul in Second Thessalonians two fifteen was pointing to oral tradition that he gave as the gospel. Okay. That's right. Okay, give so him, there's two give different him, kinds give of tradition. Him Fifteen seconds to respond. Yeah, and then we the, move the, the, other way. the oral, as I've already argued, the oral messages that Paul delivered was the gospel. Yeah. The same message that has been maintained in the written scriptures. There's no difference. Yeah, I didn't say they disagreed. I just okay. said there were two sources, oral and written. Okay, everybody deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tony, you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, he's going to begin his cross-examination. Okay. Robert, you ready? I'm ready. Go. Okay, uh, so, uh, Robert, um, you said earlier that there were these, uh, these seeds that were uh, in the uh, early church fathers concerning the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Can you... Can you elaborate a little bit more on, on what exactly are these seeds? Well, I already gave them to you in my rebuttal. Where is my paper? Okay. Uh, for example, you know, you pointed out J.N.D. Kelly, uh, you know, where he's, he points out that Basel and Chrysostom had doubt about the sinlessness of Mary. Okay. Granted. Now, but mind you, J.N.D. Kelly is a Protestant author. One of the more famous. I studied him when I was in seminary. I know all about it. Okay. Um, so he points out two fathers that um, have trouble with the sinlessness of Mary, to be expected. But you forgot to mention St. Ephraim, where he says that St. Ephraim believed in the sinlessness of Mary. Okay. And then what you tried to do is you tried to say, well, they, they believed in the sinlessness of Mary post-conception. Well, all that does is prove to me that there was discussion about what it meant for Mary to be sinless. It wasn't until a few years, a few centuries later, where somebody said, you know what, this would have to apply to her conception, because that's where, that's where it's needed in order to be complete. And so the, the doctrine developed as it went through time, just as, if, as the Trinitarian doctrines developed, or the Incarnation doctrines developed. It developed through time until we finally came to that point, yes, it must be at the conception, because that's the only way it would fit. But the fact is, the seeds were already there because these apostles, were, these fathers were already talking about it, even though they didn't have a clear and defined dogma sitting in their, in their lives. Okay, um, so what you're saying is that these, uh, these early church fathers were, were um, um, they were describing the, the, the sanctification of Mary as the Immaculate Conception, as defined in 1854? In, no, in no. The you asked me where the seeds were. The seeds were planted. I, I said they were discussing what this doctrine meant. It wasn't until 1854, and time is of no consequence here, as I said before, where the, the, all the discussion now came to a head. The flower had been growing, and it came to a head, and the Pope made a decision and said, okay, this is how we're going to define it just like Peter did in Acts 15. With all the discussions going on, he stands up, gives the decision, and the church says, okay, we believe it, case closed, move on, we've never circumcised a Gentile since. Okay? So, I mean, that's the paradigm. So, uh, people like Tertullian, uh, John Chrysostom, uh, Irenaeus, um, when, th when they spoke about uh, Mary committing personal sins, uh, where do you believe they got this idea from, that uh, Mary was a sinner? You know, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Papias, uh, Lactantius, they all had, you know, some kind of different ideas than what the church finally accepted with Jerome, Ambrose, Augustine, and so on, okay? 
So it's not just in this area of Mary where they had a question. And the fact that these fathers had questions, that's the natural consequence of being a human being. Okay? These fathers are going to toss these things around back and forth for centuries until they come to resolutions on these issues and make a decision. Right, Robert, my question, though, was where did Tertullian, John Chrysostom, Basil the Great, Irenaeus, um, Cyril of Jerusalem, where did these fathers get the idea that Mary sinned? From the fact that they thought, you know, that Mary was like everybody else, just like you do. So They, they jump to conclusions. They think that because Mary was a, a human, that that makes her necessarily a sinner. And the church found out, no, that's not necessarily the case at all. So it doesn't bother you uh, that some of these fathers are canonized saints in the church? No, not at all. And so they could the still disagree. has nothing to do with their so, theological So they, they could still disagree with the, 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 the dogmas of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, contradict them, uh, and still be uh, saints in the church. No, there was no dogma at that time. I so, kept telling you that. In terms of the, the only dogma came in 1854. You could, you could disagree with the Immaculate Conception any time you wanted up until that time. And they did. So let's talk about the, the Marian uh, apparition. So the Dominicans and the Franciscans vehemently fought over this, uh, this whole issue of the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Now, the, the Franciscans uh, claimed that St. Bridget received a vision of Mary wherein Mary told her that she was the Immaculate Conception. But uh, St. Catherine of Siena received the revelation where Mary said she was not the Immaculate Conception, but was conceived three hours, uh, sanctified three hours after her conception. Um, how do we reconcile the fact that these two people, considered saints in the church, received apparitions from Mary, which I believe you also hold to? How do we reconcile that major contradiction? Well, because the church does not hold Marian apparitions as Catholic dogma, number one. You can have Mary say anything she wants to somebody. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. And that's why the church has a studious effort to try to make sure that any Marian apparition that's claimed has to be approved first by the church. Okay. So um, the fact is that, um, Marian, as I said, Marian revelations do not form dogma in the church. And even if it was uh, the Marian apparition was approved, it has nothing to do with the dogma in the church. So you're, you're going down a rabbit hole here, and it's not going to prove anything. Well, I don't think I am. I, I'm asking you, do you believe, uh, do you believe that St. Catherine of, uh, of Siena received a, a revelation from Mary? I don't know. It doesn't matter. Do you because believe? it has nothing to do with the doctrine of the Immaculate well, Conception. it mattered enough that the Dominicans and Franciscans uh, violently uh, argued over these two issues. They can argue to all the they point, want. Uh, the fact the, is, Marian to, dogma, Marian apparitions have nothing to do with Catholic dogma. That is a fact. But you do concede the fact that there is clearly a contradiction there between the Dominicans and the Franciscans on this topic. Yeah, but it has nothing to do with our debate. But it does in the sense that both, one argued for the Immaculate Conception by appealing to a Marian apparition. The other one argued against it by appealing to a Marian apparition. Uh, Tony, so would you agree that, that we do have a contradiction here? Apparently, it's a contradiction. I haven't studied all that St. Catherine said or all that the other saints said, so I can't make any firm conclusions on that. But my question okay. was, is I it a contradiction? You, let, let me say this. I'll grant you there's contradictions all over the Catholic Church. Okay, There's people who disagree with the multitudinous, multitudinous things in the Catholic Church. Is that a, is that a word? Multitudinous? Multitudinous, Okay. Yes. American slang, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this happens all the time. I'm in... I'm in Constant conversations, constant conflicts, constant, constant um, uh, disagreements with fellow Catholics over how things are going to go and what this means or what that means, just like you are with your Protestant brethren. Okay, so th these things are expected. It's normal. It's understood. It's, but that's why we have a church, because after all the discussion is over, the church comes in and says, "Okay, fellas, you can stop talking now because we've made the decision. Here it is. You can live by it. You can take it to the bank." Okay, that's what we've got that you don't got. Well, I have the scriptures, but uh, in the case of, of the seven popes that I mentioned earlier, uh, Robert, why, why did all these popes oppose the uh, Immaculate Conception of Mary, like Pope Leo the Great, uh, Pope Gregory the Great, Pope Innocent III, and so forth? I, you know, we keep repeating the same thing, Tony. I told you they were discussing the issue. They had their opinions. Everybody was formulating this, these ideas in their mind until 
after a while, the church made the decision and says, here are the boundaries. This is what you can say about it. This is what you can say about it. Up until that time, anybody could disagree with it. As I said, Cardinal Cajetan disagreed with the canon of scripture that had been propagated for 1,500 years. And he had the right to do so because the church had not infallibly defined the dogma until 1563. The uh, philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, which is considered the official philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church, what was, uh, what was the position of St. Thomas Aquinas on, it's not on the Immaculate Conception? Of the it's, yeah, well, his philosophy became the backbone of the, the transubstantiation. Well, the backbone and official but, philosophy but, are two different But things. let me just ask the question. Let me just ask the question. What was the position of St. Thomas Aquinas uh, on the, uh, the question of the Immaculate Conception, which was being debated in his day? Yeah, he didn't believe it. So, so the fact that uh, this doctor of the church, the angelic doctor as they call him, the fact that Aquinas had issues with it, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux had issues with it, and why did they oppose it? What was, their, what was their basis for opposing the dogma of the Immaculate Conception? First of all, each man is limited in his intellect. As good as Aquinas was, he made mistakes, and mm -hmm. every Catholic theologian will admit that. My question is, what was the basis for rejecting the I don't know what conception? the basis was. I mean, I mean it was scripture. I, I, I know Aquinas, no, it was not scripture. It was scripture. No, it was not. Yes, uh, sir. Thomas Aquinas did not believe in sola scriptura. That is well, he, that's his argumentation for rejecting the Immaculate Conception. Yeah, well, so then he misinterpreted Scripture, which is exactly what you're doing, <laughs> okay? All right. This is good, right? We're uh, going to begin with closing arguments, although I thoroughly enjoyed this. The multitude of this. <laughs> I learned a new word. Yes. Terrific. All right. Dr. Uh, Robert Sanchez is going to begin his uh, closing statement. Uh, we go up to the podium, right? Yes. Up to the podium. Thanks, Robert. Mm -hmm. You didn't start the clock yet, did you? <laughs> okay. Okay, concluding statements. Um, I think it's uh, rather interesting to um, read some Protestants on this issue. In my, I, I didn't plan on this in my closing statements, but I... Uh, after all the discussion that we've had, I think it's uh, apropos. Martin Luther said this about Mary. He said, But as the Virgin Mary was herself born of a father and mother in the natural way, many have been disposed to assert that she was also born in original sin, though all with one mouth affirm that she was sanctified in the maternal womb and conceived without concupiscence. So here, even Martin Luther um, had a, uh, I would never, I wouldn't call this, uh, you know, the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception by any means, but I would say that at least he was thinking along those lines, that there was something special about Mary. Um, Max Thurian, who was a um, uh, Protestant and eventually became Catholic, says this, the very ancient tradition of the church affirms a perpetual virginity of Mary, and the reformers of the 16th century themselves confessed Mariam Semper Virginem, that is, Mary, always a virgin. The entire tradition of the church has held to the perpetual virginity of Mary as a sign of her dedication and the fullness of God's gift, of which she was the object. The reformers themselves respected this belief, for Calvin and other reformers accepted the traditional belief that Mary had only one son, the Son of God, who had been to her the fullness of grace and joy. In regard to the Marian doctrine of the reformers, we have already seen how unanimous they are in all that concerns Mary's holiness and perpetual virginity. I think that's uh, interesting that this man who was a Protestant when he wrote this sums up the whole Reformed faith as believing that Mary was special in regards to her purity, her virginity. And um, I can go on more with those. Um, 
Thurian states, we can state to those who on the one hand would wish to speak of Mary as if she were sinful. Oh, I'm sorry, let me start from the beginning. We can assert nothing other than this, for this is the most as well as the least, that we can state to those who on the one hand would wish to speak of Mary as if she were sinful, or on the other as separated from our condition as human creatures. We do not see how either the one or the other can be legitimately can be legitimately proved from the gospel. All right, so now let me give my final statements. What I'm going to do here is just recap what I've said in my positive opening statements, because I believe it is so important. The Immaculate Conception, which is the fact that Mary was conceived without sin, was necessary so that Mary would not transmit the curse of sin to Christ. Since if he was sinful, he could not be our Savior, and we would have no salvation. My opponent has not given us a method by which this has happened. He just says that because the Holy Spirit can conceive Jesus in the womb of Mary, that this automatically makes Jesus free of sin, even though he gets his human nature from the sinful human mother. Number two, the Immaculate Conception does not include an exemption from death for Mary, since she must be able to transmit the curse of death to Christ's human nature, so that he would be able to die on the cross and be our sinless sacrifice to God, which I backed up by a quote from Galatians 3.13, in which it says, Christ became a curse for us because anyone who dies on a tree is cursed, a quote from the Old Testament. Three, the Immaculate Conception does not need to be taught explicitly in Scripture in order for the doctrine to be true, since Scripture never claims to be the only source of divine truth. I pressed my opponent on this in 2 Timothy 3.16. He could not show me where the verse says that, it, that Scripture is the only authority. Number four, the Bible and church history show us that the church throughout her history made specific doctrines concerning things like circumcision, the Trinity, our incarnation, and many other doctrines from merely implicit information in Scripture or information from tradition. And finally, the Bible itself shows us in Acts 15 that it is the church alone to make, that makes the final decision on doctrine. And more specifically, it is Peter and his successors that have the highest power to bind and loose these doctrines with the promise that heaven itself, which cannot lie, will likewise bind or loose whatever the church binds or looses. Thank you very much. And now Tony Castle will begin his five-minute closing statements. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you again for coming out tonight and for uh, giving up a uh, Friday evening to uh, come and listen uh, to uh, Robert and myself. I truly enjoyed uh, this time together, and I think Robert is feeling better. Uh, I think a miracle happened tonight, um, and I think that's a sign that, uh, that he should become a, a Reformed Baptist. Um, <laughs> but it'll be in a good way. Um, so uh, just in, in conclusion, I mean, we've heard a lot of material uh, here tonight. My, my challenge to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that you take home uh, what you've uh, heard tonight and, and test it against the facts. Test it against um, the Word of God, which cannot lie. Uh, the Scriptures tell us that we ought to prove all things, that we ought to hold fast to that which is good. And if it speaks not according to the law and to the testimony, we ought to reject it. Now, things were said tonight about the Reformers and, and particularly Luther. Of course, the perpetual virginity of Mary has really nothing to do with the Immaculate Conception. Those are two different uh, views. Did Luther hold to the view that Mary uh, was Immaculately Conceived? Well, yes. Uh, he came out of the Roman Catholic Church. He was still steeped in Roman Catholic uh, Mariology. Uh, but we have to understand that is Martin Luther at 1527. If you read the post-1527 Luther, especially uh, his sermon of 1540, you'll notice he's moved away from that. He's denied the Immaculate Conception. He's denied the Assumption of Mary and points directly to Jesus Christ um, alone. Um, and once again, Luke 135, folks, I think that's a very important text. Um, when Mary asks the question, how will this be so? How will I become um, uh, a mother if I'm, if I'm a virgin? Uh, the angel describes to her that the Holy Spirit would come upon her, the power of the, the Most High would overshadow her, therefore, or that is because of this, the child shall be Holy. Notice the text says the child is holy. Not that she's holy, 
the child will be holy, and therefore he will be called the Son of God. The scripture has answered that question for us. Um, and so in my opening statement, I, I argued that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, which was proclaimed the dogma of the Roman Catholic Church in 1854 by Pope Pius IX, cannot be sustained either by scripture or by the apostolic and church fathers. Now my opponent, all he said was, well, who cares? Uh, who cares what Irenaeus taught? And who cares what Justin Martyr thought or Tertullian and so forth? And so I think tonight you will notice that what is undergirding uh, my position is sola scriptura. What is undergirding my opponent's position is sola ecclesia. He believes that once Rome speaks, that's it. He has to accept the, uh, the binding authority of the Roman church. Um, the New Testament writers knew nothing about this doctrine, nor did the early fathers of the church. And the reason for this is that it was completely unknown to them. This is a fact that is openly admitted even by Roman Catholic scholars like uh, Ludwig Ott, Raymond Brown, and, and many others that I could cite. The idea of the uh, Immaculate Conception only begins to be seriously advocated in the 11th century. And even then, it is vehemently opposed by significant theologians such as St. Bernard of Clairvaux and St. Thomas Aquinas. The very fact that there was deep opposition to this doctrine demonstrates that it was not an article of faith rooted in the New Testament. Why so much vehement and uh, oppositions to it? They did not believe that it was found in Scripture. In fact, they openly admitted that it was not found in Scripture, nor in the ancient tradition of the Church. Ladies and gentlemen, the Mary of the New Testament is a very different figure than the one declared in the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. The Mary of Nazareth would be utterly shocked to hear what some people are saying about her and many other uh, of the uh, Marian dogmas and prayers and so forth. Mary was a blessed woman. She was blessed among women. She was only a means, however, like all of God's people in salvation history. She was not the end in God's purposes. Mary was, like all of God's elect, a sinner saved by grace. She needed a savior just like we all do. And that's why she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. When Mary said these words, she was not thinking that God preemptively saved her with an immaculate conception. It was the farthest thing from her mind. It is for this reason we need the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God to salvation. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. We must beware that we are not led astray by another gospel. We are told in Galatians 1, 6 to 9, that if we believe any other gospel than the gospel that was preached by the apostles in the book of Acts, which my opponent admitted was the death and resurrection of Christ, we come under the anathema of God. Let us look to him of whom the law and the prophets and the apostles and even Mary herself directed our attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, the only hope and savior of sinners. Thank you. Let's offer both presenters a nice round of applause. Okay, at this point in time, we're going to do our question and answers. Uh, if you haven't done so already, there's a basket up front here uh, to put your index cards in. We're also going to take an offering uh, for both of the presenters tonight. If, it, if God moved upon your heart or if you feel it's uh, something that you want to do, please also put that in the basket. If you're doing a check, you can make it payable to The Great Debate. Uh, both presenters put a lot of time, energy, and effort into this, and we just want to uh, bless them and thank them. Uh, and with that, uh, uh, could the action to protect Mary from original sin be applied only to Christ? You have two minutes to answer, and Tony will have one minute to respond to that. Could the action to protect Mary from original sin be applied only to Christ? I understand that. Um, I can't help you on this one. All right, I'll try to guess what this means. Again, it says, could the action to protect Mary from original sin be applied only to Christ? Um, I assume that the questionnaire is... Uh, saying, could it be applied to someone other than Christ? Well, that's why we believe that Mary was perpetually virgin. Um, in other words, it could not be applied to anyone other than Christ because Mary was a virgin. She didn't have any more children 
after Christ. Okay, so in that sense, the perpetual virginity of Mary and the action of the Holy Spirit to protect her from original sin go hand in hand because it only applies to Christ. I think that's what the questioner is asking. If the questioner wants to raise his hand and um, reveal who you are, yes, sir. Yeah, um, I think the reason is, as I said before, that the death has to be passed on to Christ. So, in other words, Christ had to receive the curse of death from Mary in order for Christ to die. Okay, so if Christ was given this action of the Holy Spirit to protect him from the sin, there may have been some inhibition of receiving the death from Mary. Okay. So that's what I think. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Okay. But that's how far I've thought this through. <laughs> if that helps you. Okay. Yeah, Tom, can I just take a look at that question again? You certainly can. Um, yeah, I, 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 the, the question does seem a little... and. Ambiguous. I think what the question was saying is uh, Robert's point was that God gave special protection to Mary so that um, Christ wouldn't be touched by sin. Could God have done that, not to Mary, but just to Christ? Oh, I see. Yes. Um, yes, I, I believe that that is exactly the case. Uh, and and again, I, I appeal to Luke 135 that the work of the Holy Spirit in conceiving Christ, which he's the only human being who's ever been conceived in that way, supernaturally, uh, that conception guaranteed his holiness. And that's exactly what the angel says. Therefore, because of this, the child shall be holy and, and shall be called the Son of God. And, and that is the, the whole testimony of Scripture, that Jesus Christ is uh, separate from sinners. He is pure. Um, he is holy. He is untainted by sin. Uh, and so that's why it took such a miraculous conception by the Holy Spirit to ensure that Jesus Christ would be sinless. Objection. Objection. What, 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 the verse does not tell us how Jesus became holy. Okay. 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 All the verse right. says is that Rob. he shall be called holy. Rob. All right. Rob. Just want to make that clear. Come on. I know you're feeling sick. I guess you through this. Come well, on. come on. We have to have a debate. All here. right. We are on. having a debate. A debate. He's <laughs> answered it. You've answered it. This is a question for yeah, Tony. Well, he just brought up another point. I mean, <laughs> we're both. We're just, it's a let, debate. Let we're supposed it. to bring up points. Okay. Now, am, am you I can't going, rebut I, that. You're going to get two minutes. You're going to get a minute after he answers. I this. know. What I'm asking is, when he gets his question, am I going to be able to answer uh, his question also, like he answered mine? Sure. You get. Yeah. You get a minute. Okay. That's great. The, you get a minute. Right. You can do it. We can sing good. Hymns, we can uh, I just didn't know what the ground rules were. No, we didn't discuss You're questioning how we my were. moderation abilities. <laughs> yeah. uh, you knew what the ground rules were. Yeah. They we emailed to you and we went over it. All right, let's go. Let's go. This is for Tony. If scripture is king, how come the Catholics and the Protestants cannot agree on what the official canon consists of? Well, the, the question of the canon, I mean, it's unrelated to our topic tonight, but the the question of the canon, um, it's not so much the New Testament, because Roman Catholics and Protestants agree on the 27 books of the New Testament. The, the real question is over the, the, the canonicity of the Old Testament. And the, the question has to do with the seven extra books that were added, uh, that were officially recognized at the Council of Trent as, as scripture. Um, the, the Protestant view uh, holds to the, the view that the Jews held to, that... Uh, only the books accepted or that were laid up in the temple was one of the ways the rabbis described it. The books that were laid up in the temple were the books that uh, Jews have in their uh, Tanakh, in their uh, Old Testament, and which uh, Christians also hold to. And the logic, of course, is that God had declared and revealed 
uh, his, his oracles to, to the Jews for safekeeping and so forth. Um, the Roman Catholic view uh, arises out of the view that some of these books that uh, were deemed apocryphal by some fathers like Athanasius and, and Pope Gregory the Great and then Cardinal Cajetan, some of these were accepted, uh, like people, Augustine, for instance, would accept these, and Jerome would not. Um, and so the canonicity of the Old Testament differs from that of the Protestant Jewish uh, canon. Um, and those books were officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church in the, the Council of Trent. So the Protestants would argue that we are being faithful to the same canon that the Jews were faithful to, that Josephus mentions, that, uh, that were laid up in the temple, and, um, and for that reason, they rejected the, the other texts as apocryphal. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church refers to them as deuteral uh, canonical. You, you have, have a minute. minute. Let it rip. All right. This issue of the canon is not just about books. It's about who has the authority. Okay, for example, R.C. Sproul, famous Reformed theologian, says... We have an infallible collection, I mean, I'm sorry, we have a fallible collection of infallible books. That's as far as he can go. Why does he say that? Because he doesn't have a church that can decide which books belong in the Bible. That decision was solely given to the church that existed at the time that canon was formulated, and that's the Catholic Church. And if the Catholic Church is going to make that decision, it better be infallible. Because if it's in error, that means the very book that I'm picking up here may not, in fact, be the Bible. Because there were people before me who made errors in choosing which books belong here. So they had to be infallible. So it can't be a fallible collection of infallible books. It has to be an infallible collection of infallible books. And that can only come from the Catholic Church. How'd I do? You ready? One's for you. You're going to get two minutes now. <laughs> Dr. Sungenis, did Mary die a virgin? Yes. You got a minute and 59 to go. That's all I have to say. Okay. Nothing Don't worry. Say. Well, it depends uh, which, which Christians you're talking about in, in the early centuries of the church. Um, Epiphany, Epiphanius uh, tells us that uh, about the end of Mary, no one knows. Well, did she die? Well, um, most of, of, the, of the fathers believe that she died. Now, the question of her virginity was one that was, was, was debated by some. Uh, Jerome felt that Mary was perpetually a virgin and that she had no uh, other children. Uh, Ambrose even quoted Ezekiel 44, where it says that this, the Lord has entered through the gate, and this gate shall be shut, and no man shall enter it. And he interpreted that as referring to the perpetual virginity of Mary. Uh, but then there were others. Uh, some of the Greek fathers uh, believed that... Uh, the brethren of Jesus were uh, were uh, children of Joseph from a, a previous marriage, that Joseph was widowed and so forth. But then there were others like Jovian and Helvitus, uh, and, and they taught that the, the brothers and sisters of Jesus were uh, his natural uh, brothers, that is, the sons of, of Joseph and Mary. Okay. Question for Tony. This is a kind of long one. St. Bernadette was told in a Marian apparition that the lady she saw was the Immaculate Conception. Bernadette was not schooled and had no knowledge of the doctrine when asked by a priest who, who she said, she said, why would a supernatural occurrence like this happen if it was a false statement when there have been Christmas conversion, Christians, conversions, and healings leading to a belief in the Christian God Jesus? Certainly Satan would not want this. Well, then again, uh, how do we know it is from God? Uh, if we talk about conversions, uh, we can talk about conversions to Islam. Uh, we can talk about conversions to Mormonism. We can talk about conversions to any group out there. The question that has to be asked is, how do we know it is from God? Uh, St. Bridget said she received a revelation that Mary was the Immaculate Conception. St. Catherine of Siena said Mary told her she was not the Immaculate Conception. Uh, how do we know which one is true? Well, uh, Robert would say only the church knows that. Only the church can infallibly declare that. Um, my standard, again, is the scriptures. The scriptures do not teach the immaculate conception of Mary. Paul warns us in, in Galatians 1, 6 to 9, that even if an angel from heaven is to appear to you and to deliver a gospel other than the gospel I delivered, 
that God, that angel is anathema. And so what is Paul saying? Look, there may be apparitions, angelic apparitions, and these angels may uh, propose to be giving you the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says if that angel gives you a gospel other than the one you received, that angel is under the curse of God. And so do not just go on mystical experiences. Uh, what is your standard to determine whether or not this is a bona fide revelation from God? Um, I can't accept it. I don't accept it. I don't accept the appearances of Fatima either. Uh, it's simply because they contradict what Holy Scripture says about uh, the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. I get in there. You do? Yeah. So I would say this, that um, I see why Tony is so confused because uh, when he reads the Bible, he thinks he reads in there that the Bible is the only authority, and yet he's not able to come up with a passage in the Bible that says that. I've asked him several times now for a passage that says that. So if Tony wants to... Uh, base all his answer on the immaculate conception on the fact that the Bible is the only source he can go to for that, well, then he's not reading the Bible correctly. In order for him to win this debate, Tony has to prove to us that the Bible is the only authority. He has not done so, and uh, therefore he loses debate uh, just coming out of the gate. And that's that. You yeah. lost. You <laughs> lost. Sorry. You <laughs> can all go home now. You ready? <laughs> ready. Okay. This is for you. If Mary had to be sinless for Jesus to be sinless, wouldn't that mean all of Jesus' brothers and sisters would be sinless as well? No. Because they didn't come from Mary. Oh, I'm going to stop the time. Oh. Okay. <laughs> no, because they didn't come from Mary. Uh, the, the, the other belief in the Catholic Church, according to their interpretation of scriptures, is that the so-called brothers and sisters of Jesus were not his uh, maternal uh, brothers and sisters. They, they were cousins of his. And this can be shown from the Greek words used for brothers and sisters in the Greek, Adelphos and Adelpha Phi, uh, that they that don't necessarily refer to uh, father-son or mother-daughter, mother-son relationships. They can refer to relatives, kinsmen, uh, that, that uh, kind of relationship. So, uh, as a matter of fact, none of these brothers or sisters of Jesus are called sons of Mary or uh, sons of uh, Joseph. They were, they were just called the brothers and sisters of Jesus. Only Jesus is called the son of Mary. Okay? And I think that's very important to know. So, uh, to answer your question, Mary was to be had to be sinless for Jesus to be sinless. Wouldn't that mean all of Jesus' yeah, brothers and okay. sisters? Were so we answer your question. The answer is no. Okay. Yeah, I would I would take the position that, that these were uh, natural uh, half uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus, and uh, I think any um, clear reading of the text without any uh, presuppositions uh, that of Mary's perpetual virginity or the immaculate conception, I think, would lead you to that conclusion. There is a word in Greek for uh, for cousin, and it's uh, syngenis. Um, and uh, near kinsmen, etc. But he uses the word Adelphos and Adelphi, uh, Adelphi for his brothers and sisters. Now, uh, Matthew one twenty five, uh, I think it's clear that Joseph uh, did not know her, which is a, an idiom for sexual relations. Joseph uh, did not know her until uh, she brought forth <clears throat> uh, her firstborn son, which was Christ. Uh, so I think it's pretty clear in the Jewish context um, that uh, Mary and Joseph were legally married, and, and in that relationship. It's a blessing of God to, to bring forth children and so forth. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, presuppositions at play here uh, when it comes to the question of the family of Jesus. Uh, so I don't think there's anything wrong with them being his natural uh, brothers and sisters. Half brothers. Okay. This one's for you, Dr. Costa. Uh, Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit in a sinless action. Mary was conceived by lustful fornication. Is this addressed by the dogma dogma of immaculate conception. Um, well, I wouldn't say that Mary was conceived in a lustful fornication. Uh, Mary's parents, now we don't know who her parents were. Holy Scripture does not tell us that. The first time we hear about her parents is in the Protevangelium of James, an apocryphal text. It refers to her parents as Joachim and, and Anna. Um, but, but her parents um, would have been uh, legally married, and uh, obviously their, their union was blessed by God, as marriage is blessed by God. And so I wouldn't see her as as um, as this relationship, this conception taking place out of lust uh, or anything of that nature. 
Um, I believe Mary was conceived exactly the same way we were uh, through father and mother relations. Uh, where Rog uh, Robert and I would disagree is I believe that she was conceived in sin, as Augustine believed and Ambrose believed and, and uh, many of the fathers. Um, uh, but I don't think that union was a result of, of lust. Um, I don't have a question. Okay. Uh, so Genesis, if Jesus came not to change any of God's law, he said to keep holy the Sabbath, which is the seventh day. Why did the Catholic Church change it? This isn't about Mary. I'll answer that. <laughs> no, I will answer. No, I'm the Please moderator. I made this decision. Robert, the Roman Catholic Church states the whoever, blessed. Whoever had that question, see me up in the back. I will answer that later. Yes. Robert, the Roman Catholic Church states the Blessed Virgin Mary in Mark six three. It is written. It is not. Is not this the carpenter Jesus, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joe? Joseph and Judah and Simon are not his brothers and sisters here with us. Who is lying? The Roman Catholic Church or God's holy word? Neither. Okay. Um, you have to understand the Greek language. The Greek for uh, brother or relative is Adelphos. Okay. We normally translate it as brother. But I can call you a brother. It doesn't mean that you're my sibling. Okay. That's the way they used to use these words back in those times. Sunganes, uh, that he said was cousin. Yeah, when, when there's a specific reason to mention the word cousin, as it is in, I think, 1 Timothy, and it's the only time that word is used in the New Testament, Okay, because he's, he wants to point out that this man was the cousin of this man. All right? And by that time, the language had developed, the Koine Greek had developed, where they did have a word for cousin. A lot of times in the Old Testament, New Testament, you just didn't have words for, the, for, for those kinds of relationships because it was all one clan. You know, they were just everybody was a brother and a sister, so to speak. Okay, so there, nobody's lying here. Okay, the fact is, if we say Mary was a perpetual virgin, that's because the Greek words allow us to do so. The, the Greek word of Delphos is not, is not limited to a sibling. Okay, that's just a fact. Words mean what they mean in context. And uh, Adelphos, the first meaning, is brother. Now, what determines whether or not uh, you're referring to a, a brother, like a brother in the hood, is the context. And so, naturally, you're in Nazareth, and this is Jesus' hometown, and they say, we know this guy, and we know his brothers and his mother, etc. Well, the first impression you get is these are family members. Uh, not distant cousins or, you know, a cousin from Toledo or something, but... You will notice in that passage that Mark is onto something. Now, why does he call Jesus the son of Mary? Well, this indicates to us that although Mark does not have a nativity account, uh, to call someone in the first century in Judaism the son of the mother, if you're named after your mother, the implication is that you are legitimate because Jews were named after their fathers. So what, what Mark is trying to show is that the people are throwing a slur at him, that they know something about his, the question of his legitimacy. And so... Um, Jewish uh, people are usually named after their dad. So there's more to this than meets the eye. There's an insult actually being given to Jesus here. Okay. Dr. Costa, we understand that Christ was not typical in that he had a divine nature, but how could his human nature be free from original sin? Well, it's for this reason you'll notice the Bible calls Jesus the last Adam. He is the counterpart to the first man. And the first man, of course, when he was created, was originally sinless until he rebelled against God. And so Christ is the last Adam. He is the, the, as Paul says, the first Adam was a type of him who was to come. And so as the last Adam, he would be perfect. He would be sinless. And this would involve a direct act of God, the way Adam was directly created by God from the, from the dust of the earth. Jesus Christ, in terms of his humanity, his humanity was a direct creation of God, the Holy Spirit. And so, um, because of that, uh, that operation of the Holy Spirit, uh, he was, again, holy. He was separate from sinners. But it's important to realize that he is the last Adam. The difference between him and the first Adam is the first Adam goofed up. The second Adam did not. He obeyed and brought righteousness to us and, and salvation.
Well, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that you answered the question, uh, Tony. The person is asking here how Christ's human nature could be free from original sin. And you talked about Christ being the last Adam as opposed to the first Adam, so I don't know how that answers the question. Uh, this is a very deep question. It gets right to the heart of the matter. The heart of the matter is if Mary produced Jesus, his human nature, that's where he got it from, and she has a corrupt human nature, then I don't see any way that Jesus is not going to have a corrupt human nature unless there's some kind of intervention of God. But uh, all is first. If the Immaculate Conception is such a critical theological point, absolutely essential to salvation, how can you defend the idea that countless Christians died in sin prior to 1854? Why wouldn't God make such a critical theological truth crystal clear? Because holding to a dogma is not a criterion for salvation. There are certain doctrines or dogmas that are necessary for salvation, like believing in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Okay, If that is refused, that, that's been known since the church started. So anyone who refused that doctrine from, when, from the church's inception would know that they're, that they're not a believer and they're going to be judged. Okay, um, But when we get into these ideas about esoteric doctrines like the Immaculate Conception, or esoteric doctrines like the Trinity, or esoteric doctrines about the role of the Holy Spirit. Because someone that's not familiar with those doctrines does not make them unqualified for salvation. And as I said before, the only time that they would be required for salvation is when the church finally dogmatizes those doctrines and says, now in this day, 1854, December 8th, is when you must believe this doctrine. Prior to that, no one was held responsible for not believing in the Immaculate Conception. And that's the way the church has always worked. You're only responsible if the doctrine is made and if you know the doctrine and that the church has put it out. Otherwise, you have an exception or an excuse for that doctrine. It doesn't mean that you're going to be saved. It just means for that particular doctrine, this will not be held accountable against you. You know, the, the papal bull, Ineffabilis Deus, makes it, makes it obviously clear at the end that, that whoever does not agree with this is, has, has removed himself from the church, from the unity of the church. But again, I, I cannot help but, but notice the, you know, we hear about this 1854 and now you're, you're going to be guilty of this. We, you know, when I made the comparison with, with Mormonism, uh, Joseph Smith did say that it was new. He said it was the restoration of the gospel, that what he had received was in fact the restoration of the gospel. And that, and that it's incumbent on all people to recognize Joseph Smith as a prophet of God and Brigham Young and all the rest and to accept the Book of Mormon. Uh, and so it, it just sounds like, um, and considering the fact that Pope Pius IX um, had leanings towards the Franciscans and they were the ones who were the, the ardent champions of the Immaculate Conception, it just sounds very strange to me that the New Testament establishes that the one thing that we need to do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Christ is enough, ladies and gentlemen. We don't need anyone else. Christ is sufficient. Christ is enough for our salvation. Dr. Costa, you mentioned the Catholic position on Mary was similar to that of Pelagius. How so? Pelagius believed people could sin. Uh, yes, what I meant was, uh, yes, Pelagius believed that you could sin if you so chose. Uh, he did not believe that you were born with sin. He did not believe in original sin. And this was the reason for Augustine's uh, opposition to Pelagius and writing against him. Uh, his belief was that we are, we are all conceived uh, pure, we're all conceived sinless, and it is our choices in life to rebel that makes us sinners. And so, uh, from Pelagius' point of view, um, the reason why uh, we, we, uh, we sin, the reason why uh, we're sinners is because we sin. Uh, and Augustine, of course, refused that. He, he refused to accept that because it violated the scriptural teaching that we all are in Adam and that we all inherit this, uh, this original sin from Adam. My point was that 
Pelagius actually uh, would have been an ardent supporter of the Immaculate Conception. He would absolutely agree that Mary was conceived without the stain of original sin. But what Pelagius would do is he would apply that to everyone. And so this is what, uh, what uh, Augustine said when he said that when it comes to Mary, he said this is the one place where he's going to reserve judgment on sin. But what he does clearly say is that Mary sinned, uh, excuse me, Mary's uh, purity was postpartum. It was, it was not postpartum, it was post-conception. After her conception, she was sanctified later in the womb. But Pelagius did have, as some scholars have noted, he did uh, uh, outdo Augustine on this one. He actually affirmed uh, what would later be called the Immaculate Conception. Okay, Dr. Sonjenis. If having a sinful mother means that her offspring is sinful, then how can Mary be sinless? Was her mother sinless? Why could this not happen to Christ? Well, I mean, that's the whole reason for the Immaculate Conception. Because uh, St. Anne, who was the mother of Mary, would naturally transmit her uh, corrupted human nature to Mary, was the very reason that God had to intervene right at the conception of Mary to prohibit the transmission of St. Anne's corrupt human nature to Mary, so that Mary could not transmit the corrupt human nature to Christ. It's the whole reason for the Immaculate Conception. See, this is where St. Bernard of Clairvaux, uh, this is the very issue he was addressing. He said, well, uh, as the Franciscans argued, if Mary was Immaculate Conceived, um, then why stop there? Why couldn't St. Anne be Immaculate Conceived? Why couldn't St. Anne's mother be Immaculate Conceived? And, and, and let's go into a regression of Immaculate Conceptions. That was his whole point. Um, so I, I still think that the, the biblical data, this is why uh, Robert has to appeal to tradition, because he knows it's not in the Bible. He has to appeal to another plank, uh, that of, of the authority of the church to establish uh, this doctrine that, uh, that is not found in Holy Scripture. Uh. Mr. Pasta, the apparitions from Mary have been deemed demonic by many Protestants. However, Mary was, has confirmed many of the doctrines established by the Catholic Church. If so much of what she says turns people to a belief in her son Jesus as a savior, how can that be so? Even the miracle of the son was witnessed by thousands and many were converted. Okay. I think we, we have to pay heed to, to our Lord's warning that just because there are signs, it does not logically follow that this is from God. Remember Jesus warned in Matthew 7, the false prophets would be able to do miracles in his name. They'd be able to prophesy in his name. They would be able to do all kinds of things in his name. And Jesus would turn to these people and say, depart from me, you cursed ones. I've never, I, I never knew you. Now, in, in the case of Fatima, which, which I have followed coming from a Portuguese extraction, uh, the Portuguese take pride in the fact that Fatima uh, is, is a location in Portugal. Many Roman Catholics believe Mary appeared there. Well, when I, when I started looking into the, the apparitions and, and into what was being said, um, one of the things that Mary allegedly said was that, that um, she said that God has determined that he will save the world through my Immaculate Heart. Now, if you put that alongside of Holy Scripture, what does Scripture say is God's means by which he will save the world? Well, it's not definitely not through the Immaculate Heart of Mary that he's going to save the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So what I do is I look at these uh, so-called apparitions, and I look at what is the message, what is the content of those apparitions. Do they accord with Holy Scripture? Um, God did not establish that he's going to save the world by Mary's immaculate heart. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, him dying in your place to secure your salvation, and if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And so these two things cannot possibly be true. The gospel is not about Mary. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. The problem with Tony's whole approach is that the gospel is not sola scriptura. Okay? The reason for that is because the Bible doesn't teach sola scriptura. Again, I asked Tony, I challenged him to give me a verse of scripture that says the Bible is the only authority. He couldn't do so. So I don't know what gospel he's working with. The gospel that I read in the Bible is the gospel that says Scripture is not the only authority. The gospel that I read in the Bible is the fact that the church made the decision on doctrine. 
not a group of guys who said, well, the Bible alone is our authority. We're going to make the decision. No, the church made the decision in every case. That's the gospel. The gospel is also the fact in 2 Thessalonians 2.15 where Paul said, the oral tradition as well as the written is authoritative for your doctrine. And keep them both. That's the gospel. So every time Tony comes up with or is challenged with an event in history, he says, well, let me see if that's in the Bible. Well, of course, Fatima is not going to be in the Bible. And so to Tony, that can't be the gospel. But the reason is because Tony misinterprets what the gospel is from the Bible. Thank you. Um, these two questions are not pertinent to the topic of the debate, so I'm not going to use them. You can just assume that. Uh, and uh, we're, we're up to our last question. Um, but these two... Well, you've answered this, but I'll, uh, uh, that's okay. okay. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. That's fine. Um, Dr. Sungenis, you say that the only way for Jesus to not have original sin, Mary needed to be sinless. But if God could keep Mary from original sin, why could the same not be done for Jesus? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, we did. I'm sorry. We, we already answered that. <laughs> what? You, you made me read that and you didn't trust me? <laughs> I just All met you. All right, it's okay. <laughs> All right, I'll ask this last one to Tony. Um, you hold that opposition and disagreement among the church fathers and popes to the dogma of Mary conceived without sin as a reason to refute the Marian dogma. But how would you propose that the many differing views be synthesized into a coherent doctrine without a final decision on what it will be? Well, again, you see, this is this is a quite a very good question because what it's saying is, what is the standard? Uh, how do we know uh, what is the final say in the matter? And and I know Rob, Robert's been bringing up the whole issue of I haven't proven the Bible is the authority, but I think that I have demonstrated that by showing that um, the only thing that the scriptures calls theanostos, God breathed, is the scriptures. If we follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, we examine his life. Jesus never appealed to tradition. He, there was tradition. In fact, the rabbis, the, the Pharisees held to the very same view that Moses received an oral law on Mount Sinai and the written law and that those two were equal. And if you'll notice, Jesus condemns them for holding to the traditions of the elders as having equal authority with the written word of God. Um, so in his life, he demonstrated that the scriptures were supreme. That's why he kept quoting them. When he was tempted by Satan, he did not quote the tradition of the elders. He quoted scripture against Satan. And if we look at scripture as a whole, it is the only thing that will endure. The heavens and the earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of our God endures forever. And so, folks, if we take the whole counsel of God, I think it's pretty clear that the scriptures are God's very words to us, that they do not contradict each other. Unlike popes and councils and the history of the church, the reason why we have so much contradiction is because they don't come from a divine source. The only thing that is divinely inspired, breathed out by God, is the Holy Scriptures. And that is why, as St. Jerome said, ignorance of the Scriptures is ignorance of Christ. The Scriptures are the standard I use. Uh, and, and so, but my opponent has to appeal back to the Church. He has to appeal to this sole class of you that the Church ultimately is the authority. I don't find that to be the case in, in Holy Scripture. All right, the problem here is that um, the Bible does not say just the written word is from God. It says the oral word is from God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, St. Paul says this, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh in you, that you may believe. Okay, so here he's saying that the word he gave them that you heard with their ears was not considered something um, uninspired. It was the word of God, not the word of men. Okay, and that's Paul's oral teaching there. Okay, so here's the, the, the basic problem. Tony doesn't know what the scripture says. If he understood that scripture and abided by it, he would not believe in sola scriptura. 
And just because something is Theopnostus doesn't make any difference whatsoever. All it's saying is it has high quality because it's God-breathed. Where does it say it's the only authority? Tony has not given us that tonight. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our question and answer session. Again, let's give them both a round of applause. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight and supporting the debate. Please continue to listen to Iron Sharpens Iron, so where you'll hear more about uh, different debates and upcoming conferences and uh, different things with regards to theology. Uh, please give that a listen, and everyone have a safe trip home. God bless you.